Good morning, Guam, and buenas and off a day. Welcome to the People's House of Guam Congress Hall in our public hearing uh, room. Uh, this oversight hearing uh, we're about to conduct by the Committee on Education, Public Safety, and the Arts is called to order at 9.05 Chamorro Standard Time. A notice of the hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets on April 2nd, 2024, with the second notice provided on April 7, 2024. Notice of the hearing was also made known on the Guam Legislature's website and the Government of Guam Public Notices portal. Uh, this morning, the committee is holding an oversight hearing on the Guam Department of Education with the following items on the agenda. Update on temporary Simon Sanchez High School facility, school closures and consolidations, uh, CIP status, Dodea update, uh, Head Start update, public health uh, sanitation compliance, GDOE and Guam Police Department partnership for school safety, special education uh, to include uh, SPED aid status, IEP status, busing update, and vacancy recruitment. And we'll also allow an opportunity for a public comment after testimony from the Guam Department of Education. I'd like to welcome my colleagues uh, joining us today, my Vice Chair of the Committee on Education, Public Safety, and the Arts, uh, Senator Chris Duenas, as well as uh, Senator Jesse uh, Lujan. Morning, morning. Uh, I'd like to now go over the rules of conduct. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name for record keeping purposes. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or motive of any senator or individual testifying is not permitted. The chairperson of the committee may order the removal from a hearing any member of Iles Latour and Guahan who fails to observe proper decorum pursuant to the 37th Guam legislature's standing rules. Any violation of this general rule of conduct will result in the removal from the hearing by the host. And this oversight hearing is uh, part of our uh, legally mandated uh, conducting of monthly oversight hearings of the Guam Department of uh, Education. And, you know, to be completely honest, uh, we're a little bit late on uh, this month's uh, hearing, so it's Chamar standard time. Uh, you know, that being said, I'd like at this time to ask our Sergeant at Arms to swear in uh, anybody who will be providing testimony uh, for the committee. Please uh, rise and uh, be sworn in. Uh, Sergeant at Arms, thank you. Please raise your right hand. Under penalty of perjury, do you all affirm that any and all information you provide today, whether it be verbally, electronically, and in writing, be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Mr. Chair, you're under oath. You may proceed. Thank you. Susan Smasi, Sarge. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to welcome uh, Superintendent uh, Ken Swanson. We also have our Head Start um, uh, Director Angelina uh, LePay here, as well as uh, your management team. I see in attendance. I want to thank you all for uh, being here this morning. And uh, Superintendent, we'll go ahead and uh, give you the floor for your presentation. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Senators. Uh, this is a treat to have this in the morning. Uh, I hope everybody had a wonderful Easter break. And chance to reconnect and, and rejoin family when, when they've been spread around the world. If I could get the first slide up. Okay, that's what we're doing today and the opening remarks by me. That's the next slide. Um, we want to say first of all that what we're talking about today, even though the agenda has been very clearly set, it's all a moving target. Things are in, in, uh, in motion as we've moved toward the end of the school year. And also so we uh, try to prepare for whatever might be next in our community, which is always a moving target. So if we could go to the overview of the presentation, I'll make the, the update on the temporary Simon Sanchez facility and talk about school closures. And we've divided the presentation into sections just as your agenda was set up so we can be easy to follow. Going first to the temporary Simon Sanchez project, we understand and we agree that the dual, the dual schedule piggyback environment that our Simon Sanchez kids are in at uh, JFK is not good for the JFK student body or the Simon Sanchez student body in the long term. So we're working on two different options. One of them involves the uh, opportunity to have uh, other federal agency support to develop a, a temporary campus that we can have our Simon Sanchez students on all the time until their facility is complete. And the other is to try and identify some other configuration if we can't get that temporary campus that we can 
schedule our kids into school so that their, their instructional day is longer and is more conducive to the activities that are normally associated with a high school. So the temporary pr program is, uh, it's a mutual effort and communication. We're in communication with FEMA officials regarding funding for a temporary school facility that would be 90% funded by FEMA and 10% by GDOE. This would involve bringing temporary classrooms that are durable enough to operate in this climate for three to five years. And we could co-locate them on a campus with one of our other high schools where we could share our gymnasium and cafeteria facilities and library facilities. Um, we are currently looking at Corps of Engineer doing evaluation on adjacent property uh, to Simon Sanchez and FBLG uh, that's, that belongs to the housing department. We're also looking at Ukadu High School campus, Georgia Washington High School campus, and JFK. So we, have, we don't have that evaluation back yet, but as soon as we do, we'll, get, we'll move into the further discussion about siting and engineering studies. There's a lot that has to be done with things like drainage and sewage and water and all of those kinds of things. So that's, that's a work in progress at this time. Um, we're getting good support from all of the agencies affiliated with Homeland Security here in Government of Guam and with FEMA. Um, there is, because of the significant damage to the school campus itself, it was operational before Marwar, now it's not. So then we were able to qualify for that requirement with FEMA. Uh, going on to the reorganization of GDO, GDOE and maximizing results uh, for facilities. We're all aware that we have a lot more classroom space than we have kids. That's what's the driver, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so in our discussions, let's go to the next slide, please. There we are. We're looking at two different areas, short-term long and long-term solutions. And in our discussion, we're, we're looking at the short-term needs, processes, and criteria, and the timelines for decommissioning of schools in order to right-size the district. And I'll, sh I'll get into some of the, the data points that you, you're gonna wanna know about. The other one is, the other long-term goal is to implement the processes and the criteria and timelines over the next one to three school years to right-size the district. So we're trying to get a good picture now of where we need to be and lay out a plan for how to get there over the next couple of years. Knowing that ultimately we have to solicit a great deal of community input, look at the, the, the data points. And so what we're gonna be doing is first of all, we're looking at our current situation in the Guam Department of Education. And we worked out, uh, have an advisory team made up of principals and stakeholders from the, from the different le levels of schools so that we have the ability to build a framework. And that includes process and the criteria for understanding what's, what's feasible to keep, what's not feasible to keep, um, and the timeline to do it. And then to make recommendations moving forward. That, that team will make recommendations to me. I still have to do further work with community leaders, especially mayors and PTAs, and then put together from that, distill from that recommendation my recommendation to the board, which will ultimately be the, the deciding factor as to timing and, and what all of the different steps are. So, next slide, please. There we go. The, uh, there are several principles involved and, and that must, we have to start with an understanding of what the process has to be and it must have to do with the current conditions and particular student population trends. So where are kids living? Where are they moving to? Where are the populations? I have schools that are in totally near capacity in terms of enrollment and I have schools that are as low as 40% occupant, occupancy. So we need, to, we need to see how we can better use that space. Um, Principle number two, and that is both internal and external uh, stakeholders have to be included in the process so that they understand and can provide input based on their perspective. 
And principle number three is the stakeholders need to be made aware of, of our situation and to provide um, an input into the criteria and the process to, to make, the, make the determination. So these are going to be difficult conversations for some. There's, in many cases, as we know, the, that we have family that have generational relationships to different school campuses and uh, where they attended. And as I talk to, to uh, some of my staff, you know, they're very proud of the elementary school they went to and the middle school that they went to and the high school that they went to especially. So we want to be sensitive to that. The next slide, please. The order of presentations, and we've been working, um, actually my team has been doing it, I haven't been leading it yet, but that's, that's, uh, that's about to make a shift in terms of responsibility. Um, starting in the first week of April, we work with the key division heads, that's our department chairs, principals, and had the conversation with them. And then on April 2nd, we took our, our principals, all of them K through 12, into the conversation. And then we went to work with our elementary school faculty and staff in the middle of the week. Uh, we also engaged with the uh, Guam Teachers Association because we, we obviously, when we're starting to understand moving and relocating people, there are personnel implications with that that are all covered in the bargained agreement and we have, have their support. So we're moving forward in the secondary school faculty and staff. Last week we talked with all of our teachers up through K through 12. And this week we're starting into the community information feedback and we have several sessions set to, uh, to, to happen this week, but then continuing on with what the timeline looks like, the week of the 15th, the committee will go to work to refine all the data that we've gathered to, to look at numbers, look at preferences, look at survey results, look at input that was taken during the sessions that are being scheduled this week. The week of the 22nd, right now, the schedule says to report to the superintendent. And at this point, I will, I will already offer that the week of the 26th and the 29th, those are gonna become a little more flexible because once I get the recommendations from the team, I'm gonna to have to spend some time with other significant stakeholders, and that would certainly be uh, folks from this body. It will also be mayors, it will also be PTAs, so we have more time to further inform the decision. The current situation, if we go to that slide, there we go. Our student enrollment trends are steadily down over the last 10 years, and I'll show you that information shortly. Um, the building capacities are static, but we built for 31,000 plus students. And now we're down to a significantly smaller number and we still have all those resources. And as you all are familiar, maintaining those facilities has been a challenge for a number of years and will continue to be so going forward. There's the human resource side of it. We know that we have, done, we have dis, distorted balances in, in terms of class size. None of them are over the negotiated levels. However, some classrooms in some schools are at that cap and others are well below. So we have a, the difference between having a class of 22, 23 students and, and, and the same subject area in another school, we might have 10 or 12 students. Those imbalances are driven specifically by the location of the school and the staffing of the schools. And for us to be able to, to achieve the, the requirements that we need to with a certified teacher in every classroom, we need to cross level even more. We were able to uh, improve that situation with our mid-year correction, but we still have much more work to do. And then budget appropriations are always a challenge. Uh, and I understand certainly the challenges across the island in the whole of government, as, as well as what goes into the, uh, the requirements for operating our school system. And then of course, there are the mandates under the law for the, in the 14 points that we must can, uh, cope with on a regular basis. Student enrollment trends, you can see where they are. If you look at our, our at all grade levels, we're steadily declining in enrollment. Some of that can be attributed to families leaving the island. Some of it can be attributed to movement to charter or private schools. But at the end of the day, 
as we work with um, our communities, we find out two smaller family sizes. So there's, there's a number of factors involved with this. The next graphic gives you a little bit more detail and it's a little bit more apparent when you look at that bar graph about what's happened to our student population. So the enrollment trends are steadily down. The question that we're trying to answer in this process is where in our inventory of schools, in terms of their location, where are the growth areas and where are the areas of decline? What could be gained? What could be gained by combining one or two schools? Or closing one? And then we, we're trying to stay away from that word because it's scary to people. So we're talking about decommissioning because there is an option that later on, because of the buildup on the, on the island by the military and Defense Department folks, that we could need some of that capacity back in the out years. The most recent thing I have seen was as of yesterday with, at the governor's office is a graphic that was put out by the Defense Department that shows the growth impact for schools to be in FY 28-29. So that's in a couple years out. Uh, so we need to be, be aware that we could have to reopen some other facilities. Human resource impact is, is critical. Right now we're showing 60, um, 60 vacant teaching positions. That's where we actually need 60 more class certified teachers to fill those positions. There was some other information that came out in a news article here earlier in the week that was somewhat confusing because it also included vacancies for positions that there were no there was no class there were no teachers and it was a worksheet that was misunderstood by the individual that presented that in, in the testimony but we are looking at in reality needing another 60 to 70 teachers not counting attrition and we know that folks are preparing to retire we know that some will decide that they were going to leave the leave the organization and go elsewhere for employment but that's our target to try and fill those positions while we continue to work with the University of, of Guam and other school uh, options to be able to certify more teachers. We have uh, quite a bit of work going on in that field right now. The, this one is, I think, the important one, the fiscal year budget appropriations. Um, doesn't show this year's. This year's, we, of course, we don't know the appropriation left, but the budget request that has been submitted is $303 million. So as we look at the trends, it's important to realize that first of all, the, the reality is that we come somewhat short from what our projections are in terms of what can be appropriated. And I know and understand that is more, you know, funding a government is a lot more than just the school system. It's everything that has to be done for, this, for the sake of uh, leading the island and, and managing all of the different functions of government. So I was asked to add an in internal to the next slide. This is to show our federal funding through our consolidated grant. You know, the consolidated grant is the closest one to any of the other government money that we get that su supplements our natural budget from that's appropriated here in the, in the Senate. So those two funds the, the consolidated fund and the appropriated fund make up the, the vast majority of all of our money to, to operate on, whether it's instructional program or capital improvement or anything else. So that consolidated grant number has gone up steadily, but it's not a big increase because the cost of services have gone up. Even though we have a smaller population, and as you know, of inflation impacts everything. Um, and so that, that is there. We have resubmitted or in the process of resubmitting for the new consolidated grant, but that number is not yet known. The other part of our appropriations that are federal is special education part B and C. So those, those are categorized then through a different federal office and handled entirely separately under the law and uh, Mr. Babauta will speak to that um, in more detail in a little bit. But I wanted to show you the whole, the whole picture. The next slide is 
everything that was COVID related. This is all money that, uh, for example, uh, ESF one, uh, those funds have been expended. Those are over with. ESF two is in the final late, the late uh, reconciliation stage right now, but there's no, we have no more ability to access those funds. It's now a matter of cutting off distribution and doing the audits that go along with that. The last category that's open is ARP, with, which started out at 286 million. Um, those funds end at the end of this fiscal year. And we have another 18 months to, to, to be able to close out and, and expend all of those funds. But when they're gone, they're gone. So they shouldn't be included in the, the thought process of our um, operating budget on a daily basis. The education mandates that we're still responding to, of course, a public law 2845 that mandates that we ensure that every child is entitled to adequate education, it's the Adequate Education Act. And then there are Department of Health and, and Social Services inspections and Public Law 3731 that requires that all public schools be in full compliance with DEH regulations relative to school by school year 24-25. And then the collective bargain agreements that we have determine the level of staffing, the class sizes, and those considerations that, uh, that we, we are legally mandated to, to keep. So we're trying to balance all three of those areas and we are considering all of these in the process of considering which schools to um, downsize as we go forward. The, the question about methodology has come up, as a, so who is affected, and we're really trying to understand the whole population, the community, village by village, school attendance area by school attendance area. And then reassignment areas, what would it, what would it mean to reassign students from area A to area B? What's that do to transportation? What does that do to commute time? What does that do to the overall enrollment of the school? Those things have to be considered. And underlying all of that is the logistics themselves, the capacity of the building, the condition it's in, the amount that it will cost to, to prepare the building for a higher level of enrollment. And s some folks have put forward the idea that, oh, our enrollment's down, our school's gonna close. That may be the indicator that that's the school that's gonna get students moved into it rather than out. So this is, this is all a, a much more complex process. Um, the community impact. How will the community react to the to the decisions that are made? We're really concerned about that, and I, I've I've heard some input from uh, family members and PTOs so far. But we have a lot more information together, and we're going to go about that the uh, business deliberately this week. And uh, I will continue to do that once I have the recommendations from from the committee. But the factors that we're including the population of the school and the population in the school community, both, both sides. School capacity, how many, how many students are, should be, and we have a, our engineering study that was done in 2022 that actually describes the specific capacities of every building. And we are using that as our starting point. The, the intent is to staff and populate schools at about 80 to 85% of capacity across the whole system because, as I mentioned earlier, the, the projected impact of military buildup on the, on the island is two or three years out. So we want to be able to have the room to enroll additional students in any one of our campuses uh, that remain open. So the population projections that are the Department of Labor and, and, and our local government folks can provide are very helpful in this and we're, we're using that data. Community locations and of course costs you know, we're going to have to balance. We have two campuses, one we can build up, one, okay, which one's going to cost more to build up? You know, those, those are the questions that we have to answer. And then we're, and to do that, we are going to, to the reference document, the facilities master plan, which is on our website. It's been there for a couple of years. That's very detailed and engineering analysis of every campus with cost estimates 
and guidance I've given my team is at 15% of the cost estimate for inflation because that's two-year-old data. So we're working with that. And this squad matrix is a tool that's being used across the country for this very same activity in other school systems. So we're actually plugging in all of these different data points to get down to what at least in a numerical sense makes sense to do. Then we have to factor in the human side of it and those, those impacts in the community. So the timeline um, is, is important to remember. Right now, we're finishing up the information gathering with stakeholders, mayors, and, and folks from, from your environment as well. And we have also scheduled time to meet with the governor and lieutenant governor and pull, pull in their information. The team will take next week to go in depth into this, the analysis of all of this and come out with a recommendation to me in the following week. Um, that will give me time to consider what I want to recommend to the board and also gather further information from community. Um, I, I've, based on my experience with this kind of activity before, we're going to need to take a little more time with gathering community input, knowing that at the end of the day, there will be discomfort generated uh, because of change. But the change we need to make is to make sure that we are financially viable and that we're being good custodians of the public trust and the public funds that we have. So what's next? The student attendance areas and transportation and student records moving, moving people physically and uh, administratively, uh, if you've ever done that, can be a bit of a challenge. So we're looking forward to, to uh, smoothing that process out internally and bringing DPW into the conversation with regard to their capacity to support um, uh, student transportation. So there's a human, the human resource side of it with teachers and staff. The first question that comes up, if my school is going to be downsized, where am I going to go? And there is specific language in our negotiated agreement that helps us answer that question. We will follow that language carefully and work hand in hand with the association. But the idea is to move a teacher in there. And if, I mean, the easiest part is if we're moving the teacher, their class and all their stuff from one building to the next, but that's kind of an ideal world. <clears throat> what I would expect is that we are reassigning folks to the same general area that they teach and are certified for and that they, are, that they are prepared to do in a new location. Collateral equipment and technology, what do we do with all the stuff in the school? So we're going to move stuff from one school to another. That's a challenge and if you've been looking closely at some of the ones that have after Marwar, that's a big challenge. But the logistics of that is tough. The curriculum and textbook materials, they'll move with the kids. Now, the nuts and bolts of that, my staff have to work out. Food and nutrition services, how do we, how do we impact serving lunches? Or do we prepare, how do we serve? All of those things have to be special education, and uh, Mr. Babata will speak to that. But those special needs students uh, will move. That means their resources have to move with them. Uh, and we have to be very thoughtful about how that happens. The technology services, what's the impact on our technology backbone in terms of our connectivity? So that's another consideration. Maintenance and custodial staff, how do we maintain those facilities? I look forward to having fewer facilities to maintain actively because our staff is quite good and committed to what they're doing, but they're not big enough to handle all of the facilities that we have right now. And of course, then safety and security, and that remains a challenge across all of our facilities. And then the finance side of it, how do we manage the, the cost and the, the funds that it takes to, to do that work? In, in regard to gathering community input, we're starting tonight at Southern High School with the Southern Schools, and that will be from six o'clock until, I'm hoping it's not gonna go past 10. But we'll see how the turnout is because then this and all of these sessions are also active online. So folks can either zoom in or they can hit it on Facebook or they can physically come and participate. Central Region will be tomorrow night at Price Elementary. And then the Northern Region will be at Weddingdale Elementary on Thursday night. 
So that will give my team enough raw information to get into the analysis the following week. But as I said, I'm going to continue to gather input because I know that I've got PTO efforts uh, to organize, um, organize that process and provide input that I don't have yet. Uh, but it's, it's coming. Shifting to the next in oh, agenda so, item, I can stop there. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and there's a whole I'm lot to fast digest. fast forward yeah. mode. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll just stop there and then uh, we'll give the uh, senators a chance to ask uh, questions. But, you know, I just wanted to uh, give you my thoughts on the process. So we've been in here every month and I remember uh, several oversight hearings back. Uh, you had talked about uh, initiating this process um, and then we had several meetings and I uh, had the understanding that the process was kind of put on the back burner because you were uh, in discussions with uh, representatives from DODEA and the thought had been let's see what or if DODEA needs any facilities and we won't be able to look at the uh, consolidation and decommissioning of schools until we have an accurate picture of uh, what DODEA is going to uh, need and so uh, I was a little surprised when I started getting these uh, Zoom links from the meetings uh, for the staff, right? And I think that uh, while I support the effort because ultimately uh, at the end of this effort, we should realign the department and bring the cost of uh, the department down so that we can maximize and benefit more resources for the students in the classroom. So and I support it. The issue I have is the uh, notification and the opportunity for public uh, input. So, you know, here in the government of Guam, uh, you guys know with the public notices that we can't even wipe our nose without giving five-day notice. Um, and so the notice for these public meetings uh, came out at 9 o'clock on Saturday night, and the first public meeting is tonight. And so my concerns were that, A, we didn't provide adequate notice uh, to the public uh, about the opportunity to provide uh, input, and then, B, the opportunities uh, for the public to provide input. Although you did say that you're going to gather further information as it stands now, we're looking at three uh, Zoom meetings uh, this week. And, you know, this is a, obviously this is an issue that's going to impact uh, people's lives, you know, uh, they're, they're where their kids go to school, uh, how they're going to have to drop them, teachers and relocation. I know you understand in your presentation how many different uh, areas uh, this is going to impact uh, people on. And so I was just concerned that again, we didn't get enough notice and that there might not be enough opportunities for the public to provide input. And so outside of the Zoom link and the three community meetings this week, can you expand further on what you mean when you're going to say you want to gather further information from the uh, public? And then the uh, second question is, does this input matter? Or are these decisions uh, made already? Because it, it kind of seems to me like when you, you uh, announce you know, a few days before the meeting and you have this uh, limited opportunity for public engagement, that some people out there are saying, oh, the decisions have already been made and this opportunity to provide input is uh, really a token opportunity. So could you address those uh, concerns? Certainly, uh, and at the, to be very clear, no decision has been made on any specific campus, whether or not it would be consolidated or not. <clears throat> It is unlikely that we would do that with any of the lease facilities. We'll probably put more people there if it's the capacity uh, 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 it will allow it, because it wouldn't make sense to impact any of those. But there has been no discussion. We've, we've looked at a couple models of how could you do it, but it's, we don't know what the data that we're going to have by the end of this week into next is going to tell us. So there has been no decision on that. And I have to, all I can say is with regard to the information from DODEA, I have three different avenues of information and they have all gone silent. The most recent thing I have is a graphic that was provided through the Defense Department with the, to the governor's office about where dollars are going to be expended in what categories and schools doesn't start till FY28. That tells me that the DODEA Milcon budget is two or three years out, and the rest of it's going to be up to us. And the influx of people and the rate that they come onto the island and the capacities they come on, that's why I'm trying to build in that 10 or 15 percent flexibility on every campus. So no matter where 
families settle down, we've got school space for them. Right, and and so the, uh, and I know we're a little out, but what you've seen uh, with the governor and the uh, uh, funds uh, coming into effect for fiscal years 28 and 29, is it still uh, anticipated that we're gonna see an influx of several thousand students? Uh, That's what I'm told, but I, like I said, my sources have gone silent as recently as this weekend, I tried to get more information from the director of DODIA, no response, okay. and that's unusual. Right. So things are changing at their level, and um, that's way above my pay grade. Right. Uh, on the temporary facility for Simon Sanchez uh, High School, I'm encouraged that uh, you're providing more information uh, on this, but I wanted to ask, is there a possibility that when we look at uh, decommissioning or consolidation of schools, and, and you know what I'm thinking, because I've heard talk about this, uh, is for example, Chief Brody, right? So we have three elementary schools in the Timoning area. Has there been any discussion about maybe possibly using uh, Chief Brody for a temporary Sanchez uh, campus so that they can share facilities with-, with That's uh, on the table. But it, we haven't reached a decision because there's a lot of moving parts in this. And if we can get the, the, the FEMA funding that we're looking for, and I can find a, a place to have the whole student body together as a student body, I think that's the, the outcome that most of the community members would prefer. Okay, I've also heard uh, discussions about, and, and what you just said, maintaining the whole Sanchez body on one uh, campus. I have uh, heard that there was a thought or conversation about uh, just dissolving the Sanchez uh, family, so to speak, and sending them off to different schools until we complete the construction of the uh, new campus. Is that the last resort, or is that even um, something that you guys are discussing? I would prefer not to consider it. Okay. Uh, I'm very much tuned to the, the, the sentiment behind continuing the school itself as a school and getting the project built. Um, and we support that. Good, okay. Yeah, that's encouraging that you're uh, considering all of your options uh, relative to the shark uh, community. I, I was able to judge at the Sharkcella um, the other night and you know, uh, despite being homeless, which is, this is something these kids talk about. I mean, in all their presentations, they always talk about, hey, we're homeless and here we are, we're still thriving. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I told them that I'd ask about the plans for the next school year and so thank you for that information. Um, I, I guess I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. I did have a bunch of other questions on some of the other uh, items, but just for the record, uh, the three community meetings this week uh, will not be the only opportunity for the public to provide input. No, I, I will be interfacing with PTOs next the, the following week uh, to get to get their their information, and then uh, I'm going to be talking to the to the board before this is presented to them in terms of. A decision uh, to get further input from them because they're getting they're getting fairly consistent communication from right. their constituents too. Right. I think it'd be a good idea too to set up a, a standing email so that if people wanted to provide testimony or input, they could just uh, email uh, that to whatever address you know, school decommission, gdoe.net or something. I just we think because uh, I, I know I saw in your uh, your report to the board and some of the draft documents about the decommissioning process is that you guys are anticipating uh, opposition from uh, the community. And I think that we can. I mean, there's going to be opposition. You're right. It's uh, it, these are very emotional decisions. I mean, absolutely. You're right about that. Yeah, but I think how we minimize that opposition is we have to be very transparent and and be sure that we're providing the public with enough opportunity. Uh, to engage in, in the process. And I think that's how you can minimize uh, the opposition. I'm not saying you're gonna get rid of it because obviously, right, people are gonna be opposed to a lot of these uh, moves. But I think if we bring them along and we explain that at the end of the day, the, the ultimate benefit is gonna be for the students in the classroom, then you know, I think that we'll see more support for it. Thank you. Okay. No, uh, we, we intend to, to be as transparent as, as humanly possible. Uh, are we going to be able to please everyone? Well, Abraham Lincoln had some things to say about that. Yeah. We'll, we'll do the best we can. I'm just gonna say though, for the record, Superintendent, you gotta do better than sending out notices for meetings on Tuesday, late Saturday night. I mean, that is just, uh, to me, it's unacceptable. I mean, I had the, I had the media 
uh, blowing me up Thursday, Friday because they're hearing from the staff about these meetings and there wasn't uh, much information about the public uh, input. So like the public rollout of, of these events and the opportunities for engagement, we have to do a better job of getting that information out to the public uh, in advance so that they can prepare for these things. You know what I mean? I mean, something uh, of this magnitude, people are going to want to attend and they're, uh, they're going to want to engage, but they're also going to want to know about it uh, with enough time to prepare. So. Understand. Thank, thank you thank for you. the thank input you. on that. Right. Uh, vice, I to, uh, first, I want to recognize uh, my colleagues, uh, Senator Joanne Brown and Senator Talatidegui, as well as Senator Roy Kanata and uh, Vice Chair uh, Senator Chris Reynas. Did you have any comments, questions, concerns on the first part of the presentation? Mr. Chairman, yes, I do. Um, I concur with your discussion on communication is king, and notice is definitely something uh, that is, is, is going to be paramount. Welcome to the DOE family that's here today to give a number of different uh, pieces of information on topics. I want to start by sharing that I'm also encouraged by everything that you're doing to deal with the issue of the home of the sharks. Um, one question I had to begin with, and congratulations once again on the groundbreaking for the uh, upgrades to FB Leon Guerrero. Um, I know that in a lot of different uh, studies that I've seen and uh, uh, that there has always been some discussion, particularly in this time where it's going to take us time to build a new Simon Sanchez, that um, perhaps holding um, the ninth graders over um, sometimes has is, is, is been studied as being a good idea. I wonder if when FBLG is, is done, because it looks like it's on a timeline maybe to meet at least mid next school year, is there a possibility that they have the room to keep eighth graders uh, that would be graduating to ninth over? We have not investigated that, but that's certainly worth a close look. Because my next question will be um, if, that, if that is even feasible or possible, um, then have you then now engaged in maybe with the Guam Association of Realtors or other organizations on all commercial buildings available in order to maybe um, that could be converted um, to handle the additional three grades? Because I, I think it is really, I think most of us realize and know it's untenable to continue uh, for any length of time with the double sessions at JFK. We have had initial conversations on, on the, in the real estate market for retail space that's available. I could think of a couple that are actually brand new, but I don't see them opening. I don't know what's going to happen there, but uh, this is in part contingent upon our ability to, to do the temporary facility because ideally that would put them on a campus where they can have access to the other activities, but certainly a, a retail, I've, I've seen and used retail facilities before and it's been effective, but for a comprehensive high, that worked really well with a technical school, with a comprehensive high school and all the things that go with it, football teams and basketball teams and all of that, that's another matter entirely, but it's not off the table. We're looking for every option we can find because at the end of the day, we want to get out of the double session environment. Good. You know, Mr. Superintendent, notwithstanding some discussions about communication um, and notice, um, I know it's an uncomfortable, you know, uh, venture that the entire team is embarking on. But nonetheless, I believe it's necessary. Just your graph that you put up, uh, you know, and, and that, that, um, that decline is stark, you know, over a 10-year period of close to 7,000 and upwards of, of student population. And you, as you mentioned, there's a number of different reasons for that. But... You did point out in the presentation, and I just wanted to kind of see if there's been any tabletop on this. You would, like you said, you don't know what's going to close, what's going to open, what's going to increase, or you know, what or what's going to happen. But just a top of the napkin study, if you would, what would that mean? Even with the 60 teachers that you're embarking on, have you done a staff analysis just based on student population? We're in that process at the moment. Okay. And we're, we're collecting information, especially prudent right now under the contract as well as the, the intent forms for next year from all of our employees, uh, uh, teachers, administrators, for everybody. We know, we know of several administrative vacancies, so we need to balance that against the leadership of 
whichever campuses are going to remain operational. So there, we are in, that, in the midst of that work now. So in the beginning slides, you, of course, showed the differences in budget requests and then budget allocations or what you were actually uh, given as a budget. Um, I'm curious, on the 2024, the number of 234, I believe, that was, was the actual appropriation level, um, did that include the 20 million that was uh, given to you in addition during this fiscal year? Which 20 million? <laughs> well... The facility, twenty million. Yeah, the twenty million we are that still was appropriated. Struggling to access yeah, the twenty million that was appropriated of excess revenue uh, for you to yeah. be able to manage your your needs. Right. The, 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 that includes the twenty million plus the ten million that were added to the appropriation for operations. Does not include the twenty million that was set aside for Marwar recovery. Okay. The reason why I'm asking that is because as we go forward to receive your budget request and then go through it. Um, you know, I think it's going to be important uh, for the body that uh, we realize that, that that 20 million uh, is needed and that's a level that, uh, that I'll advocate uh, to, to make sure is, is maintained. So my final question is, you know, Mr. It sounds to me and there is a lot of talk. I received a lot of phone calls yesterday from individuals who are hearing the chatter of the issue of the federal impact and the student requirements on the um, uh, buildup of personnel that will be coming to Guam over the next decade. Um, as you mentioned, the, the speculation is starting, I think 2028 was the mention. But you know, Mr. Superintendent, it's starting to sound, and this is the calls that I got, it's starting to sound like this may be morphing into a transition as to oppose to a decommission. Because unless there's Dodea is putting on the table and will put on the table going forward that they have a full plan to build out. That student population is a, a population based on possible dependents or contractors and other individuals that are coming in in support of the buildup. Is that analysis been done? That's, that's what I understand. It is being done. I don't have the data that's coming out of that. Um, my anticipation is that the biggest impact that we would see would be in the community of civilian technicians with the, the air defense system that's coming in because technical representatives or manufacturers of that equipment tend to carry the weight of, that would otherwise be done by active duty military. So there, there's an army component to that and then there's a civilian technician component that that's where I think we're going to see the influx of a couple thousand students. Bringing in the Singapore Airport, Air Force doesn't bring family members. Bringing the submarine uh, port facility uh, ramp up doesn't bring all that many, and they would be probably active duty. So um, at this point, that's the best information I have. And like I said, my sources have gotten real quiet. Okay. And I think that's important, you know, because like I said, the speculation is running wild and it makes sense. Um, so I think once again, talking about communication, talking about putting out information, you know, um, um, people want to know, people need to know if they, you know, full transparency of these discussions are going on, you know, then, then we should put that on the table because that changes the complexion completely. Because if you're going to have an influx in that situation where there's that federal component and the component of, of the growth not necessarily being organic to us, then we need to put on the table once again who's funding this and how because it may ease to a transition as opposed to a downsize. And so planning is key. You, like you said, you, what, what, what are you going to be doing if you're, if you're consolidating, cross-leveling, moving, possibly mothballing a school or two, and then only to have to ramp up once again, within a very short period of a couple of years. It may be better also to ease the public's concern and during this discussion is that it may actually be movement temporary, but actually a transition to repurpose these schools, get them uh, reconstructed and upgraded for the eventual outgrowth. So I think that, um, you know, that has to be fully transparent and we need to be talking about it because in the end, other than a full-blown construction of Dodea military schools going forward, this is going to be an issue where DOE is going to also be at the center, in my opinion, 
of having this student population that's going to be need to be educated. We'll keep that in consideration. I, I hear, I'm processing everything you're telling me, and that uh, that's certainly not off the table. And, and our, our focus is, includes keeping our schools active in terms of maintenance and, and custodial care so that if we need them back, we can have them back. But the, the added piece to that is perhaps we, we consolidate one or two schools, spend the time renovating them so that if we have to reopen them, they're ready to go. Um, but that, I'm hoping we can get better information from our defense partners and, and know more about what to expect. But right now, that information is thin. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting this on your radar because don't be surprised if you start hearing these questions uh, in some of the meetings that you're having because the speculation is running rampant. I'm sure. And, uh, you know, these are not, uh, you know, these are individuals who are contacting me that have <laughs> higher level of, uh, you know, of intel than, uh, than you know, your average person. So uh, it's good. The speculation is there. And so let's put it on the table and let's talk about it. Certainly. Finally, going into the, um, all of the presentation up to where we are right now, and in particular with the meetings that will be going on and everything that will be discussed, is this transition anticipated for the 2025 budget cycle? For the, 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 the current 2025 budget? No, the, the budget we built is based on current operations. Okay. 40, but we're... 40, well... 40 campuses. So your, so your budget submission that we will be receiving is going to be based, based on, on status our, quo? On, based on our current size. Okay. At, at the end of the day, all recommendations notwithstanding, whether or not this is a phased-in approach, so if we were, for example, to do nothing this year because the community would prefer it that way or the board decides that because it's a board decision as to how this will be implemented i'll make recommendations but i don't have the authority to to to, to take the action that's a board action so there could be the decision to wait a year there could be the decision to phase in we, we say we anticipate six schools we'll do two a year for three years that's that's the kind of determination that would come from the board and then we would act on it from there. So I ask this because as we approach the budget season, which is right on top of us right now, um, you know, that, that's, we're going to have to contemplate what that looks like. So it looks like um, it, it will be a status quo budget if, at, in terms of your current structure right now for this at, at upcoming this point, fiscal year. And then I would, I would plead to defend the budget proposal later rather than sooner. <laughs> so that we'd have more accurate information. Not asking for that now, sir. Just <laughs> making sure that we have that benchmark because, you know, uh, as you've probably seen, there's been a number of oversights recently and there's going to be probably a lot of um, competition and flux for budget, uh, you know, the budget coming up this year. Uh, there's the recent CRER, once again, is capping above what's obligated this year. So. I think that um, many of us, you know, we, we're just trying to not defend it today, but to know what benchmarks are out there as we continue to receive and get into that season. So um, this is such a big impact in terms of what's being proposed. So it's good to know, at least going forward, we're looking at a, a, the snapshot of what you currently and your obligations are now, at least going into the next fiscal year, unless changes are made. Uh, subsequent to that. That's all I have for now, Mr. Chairman. Uh, definitely other questions on the other matters. Thank, so thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> morning, Mr. Uh, Superintendent. How are you doing this morning? Um, earlier, you, you uh, mentioned that the, um, one of the options will be temporary campus and the FEMA uh, versus GovGo or DOE will have a 90-10 cost share? Correct. Okay. Now, the temporary campus, are you talking about an erection of a campus, uh, you said, on the adjacent site to, um, to um, um, Simone Sanchez? Um, is that an empty lot now? That, that it's, it's a Department of Housing facility that's going to be deactivated. So it would, 
look at using the existing buildings plus temporary buildings. Okay, like the modular type buildings, right, that are right. going to be erected. And you said that light, the, the life of that would be about three, between three to five years, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. I, well, that's based on, my, on sure, our sure. estimate sure. for the construction time for Simon Sanchez. Oh, okay. So that, that being said then, is that then the most logical um, situation that's going to happen as opposed to as the, the chairman had mentioned that uh, Chief Brody has been looked at as, uh, as, as part of the campus and maybe equivalent to like a ninth grade academy or something like that? That's, that's one of the options that's being looked at. Um, we have two parallel groups working on this process. There's the, there's the group that's working on the temporary campus and there's another group that's high school principals looking at what are the options with the existing configuration, what makes the most sense. Um, and that's where the discussion of using the Chief Brody campus comes in or possibly doing a split between two other campuses so that we can, we can use excess capacity that the challenges, uh, we, I don't have that recommendation back yet from them because we're, we're waiting for responses from actually from FEMA and the Depart U.S. Department of Education on funding. But the idea behind that process is to bring in temporary classrooms, that, and we're talking 60 classrooms because of the size of the Simon Sanchez mm -hmm. student body that are weather durable, for this environment similar to what was done in Saipan mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that we could have those campuses set up on an existing high school campus where you have high school facilities that can be shared and with creative scheduling we can have both student bodies at school at the same time work them through lunch work them through athletic practice and all those things and they have have that advantage that is the most desirable from the input we're getting the next, the next best is to start looking at ways to house those students in different locations, and that's what I, I'm trying to avoid breaking up the student body, although we, we may have to do that, uh, depending on how this turns out. So it, it's in all in motion right now. I don't have any definitive answers. Mm -hmm. But we know that we're no matter what, we're going to be part of the year in the split session set up, but we want to get out of it as fast as we can. Well, just based on, again, what you're saying in regards to housing in one facility versus, again, multiple facilities, I think that would be more of a logistical nightmare uh, in multiple facilities. And, yeah, and, uh, and it's it won't not be desirable. As, no, it won't be as cost effective as well. There will be, I mean, a greater cost. Uh, for that as well in multiple facilities as opposed to just um, one, you know, one area in, contained for, uh, for the high school. No, I, I'm fully aware of that and we're still working on the process. It's, we don't have a solution yet. Okay. Um, in regards to the public notices and, and, and um, um, the community uh, being consulted and, and, and in the decisions that are going to be made for either consolidation or closure, because I um, there are one, two, three, four, nine schools, middle school, elementary school, and thing one high school that is looked at either a consolidation or closure. Now, of the consolidation or closure, realistically, realistically, what are we looking at in in regards to possibility of a of an actual closure? How many schools are you looking at? I mean, without even, I mean, not knowing which one, but in the actual closure of a facility, realistically, what are we looking at in, in the actual closure of a certain facility or facilities? At, at this point, I don't have the recommendation from the team on that, and that's strictly a, a, a math counts activity. So you would probably be looking, majority of them would be in the elementary environment. However, neighborhoods, commute distances and those, you know, safe ways to get back and forth to school, those are all considerations. Um, so that, that mathematically, yeah, you could go to eight to 10 schools. Realistically, that may not make any sense at all depending on the location of the school 
and we have to, that's what we have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Likewise, there's a decline about 7,000 students that left the public school system, right? Went that's from correct. From 31,000 to 24,000? That's, yeah, that's okay. based okay. on our f actual enrollment counts. Oh, okay. Now, I mean, prior to their withdrawal, um, parents or guardians will have to come to the schools and obtain their, their student records for whatever school they have to go to. Are there exit interviews as to where they're going? Are they, are they I mean, I, I know, of course, there's a growth in charter schools and, and likewise public or uh, private schools out here in Guam. But I wonder what the, what the number is between losing them to current schools here in Guam, public uh, uh, or charter or uh, private schools, versus actual, actual loss to, to relocation. Because if we're losing them just to um, charter schools and private schools here, there might be once uh, um, GDOE um, um, stabilizes and, and um, I guess uh, reconstructs or, or refurbishes the schools and everything, you might get them coming back to those schools. So I'm just wondering, what is the percentage of losing them to current schools on island versus going off island? Is, is, there, a, is there a percentage of what's the, uh, of the seven, of the seven, that 7,000 that, that students that GOD has, has lost, how many, what is the percentage of them staying on island and going to school in existing schools here versus? The, inf the information I have on that is purely anecdotal. I have been given information that shows that we lost about 1,500 to 2,000 students to families that moved off the island, especially okay. when United Airlines relocated, a number okay. of folks left. I also have parent feedback that is given us to us once we're through the inspection cycle and things are stabilized and, for example, come out of alternating schedules, that parents would bring their kids back from the charter schools because they want them in their neighborhood school. Oh, and, and but that's what, detailed yeah. data, sure. I do not have that yet. Sure, okay, yeah. So basically you're saying that at this point, um, I, again, that's uh, just a rough figure that we have lost basically about 1,500 students to actually relocation off island. Correct. And then maybe the balance is maybe to, to the charters and, and, uh, and private schools. And you had also said that uh, some parents had also said that once GDOE has stabilized and I guess um, uh, refurbished several, the schools yes. that they, they may come back I've to the schools. Several of my elementary principals okay. tell us that, that their, their okay. parents want to bring their kids back. Okay, and, and that's important to know as, as we make decisions, you know, in, in, uh, in funding and things of that nature and future funding and all that, and we need to know on, on a, uh, I, I guess on an annual basis that, you know, how many students we're losing and, and whether we're losing them to actually relocation or just to other schools here, here, here in Guam. And that's important. We'll, we'll keep it in, in the process, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Uh, Senator Brown? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Certainly good morning to you, Mr. Superintendent, and your team that is here. Um, I did want to ask, as you provided in your presentation, the federal funding of the ERP at 286 million, where are you collectively in expending those funds? Because we know the timeline is getting closer. So you're um, speaking of ARP funding? Yes. We're about two thirds of the way through. Uh, most of that doesn't show up because our, pro our contracts are not being processed through the AG's office. Uh, for example, the refurbishment contract uh, by itself is $80 million. Um, right now we have received it back so that we can stamp and number every page in 3,000 pages of contract for whatever reason. We've never had to do that before. So once that backlog is, is uh, taken, but we have another, another $15 million in contracts that are in that same limbo in terms of processing. Um, they've been returned for one reason or another, then we resubmit them. But until that particular issue with contract and legal representation at the AG level is resolved, um, it's a little bit slow. 
moving things, but we've been able to move some of our things and get them done and, and sent on to the governor. But I am looking at having about 10 to $12 million that is still yet not obligated that we're going to use to find projects in each of our schools that are not involved in refurbishment that would make a significant difference on the campus and, and run those projects. But our effort is to get everything into the system and obligated before the end of the fiscal year. Well, where are you with that? Um, you know, I appreciate everybody says it's at the AG's office, it's at GSA. <laughs> where, where are you with that? that that's well, a, I'm prepared to be a director in the government of Guam because all I have to say is that, and I don't have enough money to do my job, and I'm, I'm good. So, I mean, where, I appreciate your explanation, but, um, you know, what is at the AG's office? What is, what's your timeline with them to move through so that you can process? Cause it's it's a substantial amount of money that's been allowed to accumulate for quite some time. And the timeline to use it up is it's getting very close. I mean the year is the, the year is for, almost it just started, but it's always almost over. It goes so fast. Yes, it is fast and it's fast to move that much money and do it right. Um, but to give you an example, the refurbishment contract is in round numbers an eighty million dollar contract. We were successful in identifying a bidder that could qualify the process of then finalizing the contract and, and having them review all of it and then go out and do site surveys and all of the kinds of work that go on on each of the campuses to prepare that contract, which is, is in fact a 3,000 page contract, um, took over two months. That's done. The contract is, was first sent to the AG for review and they didn't like the proposed language changes that the contractor wanted inserted, so they sent it back and said, have him remove it. We had him remove it. He agreed, signed the contract. We resubmitted it. Two weeks later, it comes back. You need to number and stamp every page in the, in the contract. So my team is doing that right now. That contract will go back for action later this week. So that should be, once that review is done, and here we are in the middle of, we'll say this is the middle of April, by the end of the month, we should have that on the governor's desk for signature, which will then turn on the work at eight different campuses. And this is fiscal infrastructure that needs to be refurbished? Yes, refurbishment. What is the, does that include things like your mold mitigation and things it, of that nature no, as well? Is that also part of this particular contract or is that a separate contract? This is not related to mold mitigation. This is restrooms, doors, roofs, spalling concrete, uh, a number of other structural things that uh, will be handled on all those campuses. It was originally a project that we had hoped would do the whole system. The prices came in at well above of the projected budget. So the, now the mold mitigation contract is at DPW. I have read correspondence from them that I have three different projects that are on hold because of the AG review, the mold mitigation fence uh, contract and uh, the- Mr. Superintendent, I just want to interject uh, there because I've spoken with the Attorney General uh, and he has assigned an attorney to review all of the Guam Department of Education uh, contracts. So uh, that's the first I'm hearing and it's actually contradicting what the AG has told me. So I'll follow up uh, well, he, with him on that. But as far as I understand, he is moving forward and reviewing all the contracts, whether it's the Head Start, Playground Procurement or any of the uh, contracts that uh, the Guam Department of Education has sent his way. At least that's a commitment that he's given to me. So I just wanted to put that out there. Pseudo Smasi. Okay. Well, yes, there is someone assigned. That's, that's, I'm very much aware of that. But anyway, the, the third contract is the construction supervision contract for Simon Sanchez project. Those three are all at DPW and they are on hold. That's the last, last information I have from DPW. <clears throat> we have uh, several projects in place. Uh, for example, there is in the, in the ARP one, and I don't know the numbers on it. We have the contract for all the collateral equipment for the furniture for FBLG. So when that project's finished, we have all, all new uh, materials to move into that building. The same thing 
uh, we have money set aside. We might have to reprogram to do the same thing for Simon Sanchez. But we, we don't have a contract for Simon Sanchez yet, so it's premature to let that one out. But we, have, we are reevaluating re our ARP dollars at least every two weeks to make sure that we have everything in the pipeline so the procurement process can operate and we don't lose any of that money. You mentioned about mitigation also, that's something that you're waiting for to get approved. Is this school-wide? Has any, any progress been made so far to address that in the schools? Or is this like one big contract, one big contract it's, for it's, all the schools? It's one big contract across the whole system. As, as in the, the fence contract takes in, I think, 26 campuses. The other ones don't need the fence replacement, but 26 do. And, those, and that money to fund that is out of the $20 million that was set aside by the legislature for the Marwa recovery. That, that, that money, yes. Okay, and yet we have not moved forward yet on that, that you're in the process. Where is that now? I mean, I know we've been talking about that since before you got here uh, with regards to the, the fencing. My understanding is it's waiting for the, the, the approvals that it's been resubmitted for process uh, through the AG's office, but I don't know that for sure. But we've been working with DPW because they're handling the contract. Uh, and we've finalized all the specifications to their desire. And I think the, for the mold contract is being able to find a contractor that is actually qualified to do that work. But um, that's the best of my knowledge is where that is right now. And the reason, the reason I bring this up is because we're not that far away, um, you know, from the timeline where we gave the extension of one year. I know much to the disagreement of the chairman, uh, the rest of us as majority determined that it was important to actually start this last school year and get as many children in classroom as we possibly can so we could get on with the business of educating them. Uh, but that timeline also is going by very quickly and we're a little, we want to know where we're going to be in that extension of where is DOE going to be to be prepared for those public health inspections? Well, I understand, but I'm asking the question now. There's, there, there's some more information on that in, mm -hmm. in the presentation today. Mm -hmm. I'm still asking the question uh, of you at this point. You, I, I, I'm, I'll be here to watch the presentation. We, but. Well, we will be moving right through the, virtually through the summer, continuing inspections. We have 16 schools that have been inspected and passed, but some are gonna start being re-inspected if we're still in the one year cycle. Um, the, uh, the refurbishment schools would probably, and FBLG won't even be finished until well into the school year, so they can't be inspected until they're done. So we're, we're going to need some flexibility on our ability to continue to <clears throat> excuse me, to continue and open and operate and, and inspect as fast as, as possible. Uh, I have submitted a schedule in here for the rest of the schools. Um, it takes us into the beginning of the school year. It's, and it's our experience that it's our capacity and DPH's capacity as well to be able to thoroughly in, uh, ex be able to inspect and report about two a month. Mm -hmm. And we are now in the process of the work that we're doing, the repair work that we're doing, was if you think back to where we were seven or eight months ago, we we're talking about phase two and phase three schools. Mm -hmm. We're down to the phase three schools now. So it's mm -hmm. taken quite a lot of work and expense to get them up to speed so they can pass inspection. But that's what we're doing. You were talking about the, uh, the possible, and of course, uh, you are still going through that process, and I, I, like my colleagues, encourage you to make sure you do address the public notice requirements, because I think that's, I mean, even though no, no official decisions are being made at these meetings, I think as much outreach as you can get, because there's always at the back end, if people don't feel engaged, then, you know, you think you're getting to the finish line, then all of a sudden, you know, the, these issues come up, and then it gets delayed because of that uh, in terms of involvement. But you mentioned that you might only be looking at a short period of time that these schools might not be in need. And you're saying that DOD has not provided enough information to give you a gauge on, or at least Department of Education a gauge on 
what the anticipated growth will be and what the need will be within the school system, but what is the plan? I mean, if you're going to actually address downsizing and you're saying, okay, X amount of schools we um, don't need because we, we only have X, this current capacity of students, but what is the idea? Are you going to mothball all these schools? Are you going to look at other options? Is, because certainly it's going to be just as expensive to have them sit there idle. So they're going to have to address maintenance of them. You can't leave a building sitting two or three years and you know, walk in the following day and expect it to be operational. No. You're going to end up with plumbing problems, electrical problems, and the list will go on. So, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, are you looking at alternatives of whether or not these schools could be used for other things? Would there be a possibility of others that are interested in doing charter schools to transfer these facilities for that purpose? That's one of the considerations, and we have been approached in a, a couple times about having them also available to be used as government office space and uh, provide that kind of, a, of an option. But you're, you're absolutely right, you can't just close the doors and hope everything stays all right. We know that there's maintenance costs involved. So there's, in our discussion, we are talking about the potential of mothballing some, for lack of a better term, um, in case we need them. But that, that's a short-term solution. And there's, there's a, probably going to be a couple facilities that would look like, if we're going to keep that, we need to replace it. And that's a, a future discussion. That that comes out of the, that long-range uh, facility study that is our facilities master plan, and we are going to use that as the basis for decision making as one of the primary sources. Well, I certainly look forward to after these meetings are concluded, what the recommendations are going to be, because I think that's going to be important. Oh, it's, yes. What we actually do with those facilities, because I I don't see you suspending them for two or three years. You know, maybe DOD will let us know and maybe, you know, we're going to get more students down the road. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have to take that into consideration, right. but I think the bulk of those buildings have to be dedicated to some purpose. Yes. Uh, because no, you, leaving them idle, I mean, you already have challenges maintaining them now. What more if they're left idle? Um, and, you know, just the maintenance, the ensuring things are still operational, it's going to be costly as well right. to do yeah. that. I realize that uh, things don't weather well in this climate. So they have to be, they have to maintain. If it's not consistently done, they deteriorate very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, look forward to hearing what, what you're going to do with that. But again, I mean, it's just, uh, I know you mentioned and the chairman mentioned you're going to be getting into how you're addressing the maintenance of these facilities shortly, and I appreciate that. But, you know, it, it's just a concern. We want to be able to have some sense of comfort. I'm sure the community does that DOE is moving forward. You have a humongous challenge I mean, things have been left for a certain way for so long. Um, and somebody seems to think that the only solution is money, that money is going to cure everything. And there's not an endless supply. There's going to be challenges on how do we effectively manage and how do we continue to maintain these facilities. I mean, Simon Sanchez, yes, there's a lot of focus on Simon Sanchez, but there are elementary schools on Guam that were built in the 60s that are far older than Simon Sanchez. And we are not going to be able to rebuild every elementary school or every middle school or every high school uh, because of age or because we haven't maintained them. That's going to be a real big issue in the future uh, if we have to go through these 10 to 12 year process to actually address new construction. Because this has been a mess. I mean, the fact that it's taken so long to build a single facility, a single school, and as, it's as if that's the only school we have to worry about building. And that's not the case. And I'm sure you know that having gone around and seen the older facilities that are there. I, I will only say that it's daunting. Mm -hmm. um, where the solutions lie, um, going forward, once we, get, once we get to where we're in a more manageable situation, the next step, is, as I see it, is really re-examining how we do K-12 K education and what works best in this environment. And so it may, may, may take us down roads that f folks haven't thought about because the traditional model that we're using sometimes appears to be not financially sustainable in this environment, in this economy. So those are, those are really complex questions. It's gonna take a lot of folks putting their heads together to figure out the best way to do it. But at this point, the model we have is the model we have and my objective is to make it work as best we can under the circumstances and, and 
get it to the level that is acceptable and, and desirable in the community. And, and you're right about the, the, the need for public engagement and discussion and work around that is going to take uh, quite a lot more than, than uh, what we've been able to do so far. And I, I did not realize the public notice timeline with this process because it, there wasn't a, like a scheduled hearing or a meeting, but I agree that we need to have maximum amount of community engagement and we'll do everything we can to make sure that happens. You know, Mr. Superintendent, I mean, your people should know that. I mean, you only got here less than a year ago. So I, I bring that up because there's a whole infrastructure behind you that I hope is working to keep you informed and meet these requirements. They're not new. Um, you know, DOE has the largest budget in the government of Guam. We would expect that all key administrators are aware of these requirements and would be there to advise you as well that these need to be met. The maximum ability of transparency for your operation considering the challenges in the past that DOE has should be a priority. And I would expect them, certainly if I was in your position, to be advising me to make sure that I meet the requirements. I appreciate the fact that you're stepping forward and, and doing most of your talking today and some of your people have time to scroll their phones while they're waiting and waiting for the time to go by. But uh, we'd like to see them step up to the plate as well. I hope they are, perhaps they are. But something are. like that is something that we ourselves are very conscientious of because we just see the need, the more awareness and the more scrutiny, and definitely DOE has been in need of scrutiny. Um, the more forthcoming you are, the easier your presentation in your life will be. Uh, just simply because that's a public expectation that we as policymakers have put in place, we have to meet them. The rest of the government of Guam has to meet them and certainly the expectation is there that DOE would meet it as well. But I don't expect you to know all that, but that's something your people should have advised you and should have put in place when these meetings were scheduled. It's been there for many years. I know I did that like almost 20 years ago, my last round here. So I just bring it up because it's, it's, it's a requirement. And, it, and when you don't have those issues on the table to deal with, then you can focus on the real issues at hand. Well, I thank you for the input and I trust they're listening. Um, but at, the, at this, uh, it was my decision as well, though, when I looked at the timeline and knowing that I'm going to have to have more time to gather that information and be able to engage with folks um, outside of that committee work, work group once I know what some of the parameters have turned out to be. But that's why I've, I've already determined to extend that, that by, at least by another week, if not more. And I would anticipate that by the time this goes before the board, that will even be um, more opportunities for input, certainly in a public public meeting, officially, but also unofficially. Well, I appreciate that. It's going to be a painful process. I mean, when you, you collectively come down to narrow down which schools perhaps need to be closed, find, you know, for very practical, right. very practical reasons, it's just going to be painful because people have such a personal sense of ownership. Well, that, you know, if that's the school you went to, that's the school your child's going to. Sure. I've been the elementary school that I went to is now a middle school, but I still go by and look at it every now and then. Let's just put it this way: Eisenhower was in the White House, mm -hmm. so <laughs> we we won't we won't count. Anyway, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions and appreciate the superintendent. Thank you, response. Senator Brown. Thank you. Uh, also, like to recognize Senator Dwayne uh, Sinicolis. Good morning, mm -hmm. Senator Tello-Taidui. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I apologize for being tardy. You can uh, mark me off as some demerits there, you know. But what was good is that many of the colleagues who spoke before me had many of the questions I had, and so I'm not going to belabor this. I know we're talking about the decommissioning of these facilities. So just a couple comments, you know, please. Uh, my concern is the scheduling to get the information out. You have a PO officer in, in place. Um, you brought her on board, so... Um, this information should have been out to the public way in advance um, and, and pushed out big time. <laughs> so I can't, ex you know, I'm, I know the uh, oversight chair, who I greatly appreciate, by the way, holding these uh, public hearings, um, oversights for um, DOE. But, you know, even though we do it monthly, that information comes up usually after we have these meetings, you know, and, and the public is then given late notice, so please, let's be a real stickler on, on these um, announcements for the public. 
So that I wanted to bring up. I also, you know, I have, a, I have a question. Many of your employees, and especially on the administrative side, work very hard on, on what they're doing. And putting this new task on them to try and do this whole decommissioning of all these schools and finding out what's the best way to, to um, configure this and move students around. Have you looked at maybe bringing in somebody who has this, you know, I, I hate to use the word matrix, like the matrix when they came in here to help with where the new hospital's gonna go, or a company such like that that comes in to provide this insight and information and does all the assessments. Have you thought about bringing in somebody with that kind of professional background on how to move forward? Not for this particular project, but, I mean, but we do use outside consultants on a, in a number of things, but it's certainly not something that uh, I would discount. I think but it's something no, you might want to consider. I mean, this is a very sensitive, like Senator Brown brought up. It's a very sensitive situation. I know schools that are being changed from one name to another. I mean, there's an uproar just on the name change. Right. Can you imagine if you're shutting down the school and redistricting your children to another school? So that is something you might want to consider on a consultant basis because, you know, you have a lot of these, uh, your associate superintendent trying to run you know curriculum trying to you know put things together it, it, it becomes overtaxing and right now we're seeing a, a good amount of exodus on our island of people leaving maintenance for an in instance it's very difficult to find someone in maintenance where we're looking at a shortage of employees so i don't want to see your people burnt out so please consider that, you know, bringing the consultant to provide good information that many of them doesn't have the background on something like this. This is new. I also want to make sure that whatever art funding that's left over that you use is not placed in areas that schools that are going to be de decommissioned because we need that money for those schools that, you know, you're going to keep up and get running and pass inspections, and it takes some kind of funding to, to repair that, or even hiring maintenance. You also have to make sure that uh, some money is, is left to, to figure out. Senator Brown brought that up. What, what's going to happen if a school is decommissioned? It's just sitting idle. And we're seeing the population in, in the schools decline. Well, one from mass exodus of families leaving, but on the other hand, we're having a military buildup again, like you mentioned. Um, and that brings me to something else. I, I lost my train of thought on something else, but, and this came up, but the military, for them not to respond to you is, is disrespectful for one. But I would hope that you, that doesn't stop you from trying to get that information, critical information on what is anticipated, that you go dra directly to the Joint Mari uh, Marianas Group, the commander of the Navy, and send a letter to them, you know, and ask them what is going on and, and ask their assistance to get a response that you need instead of sitting idle, waiting for them to respond. So hopefully you can get a little push that way. And if you need our help, I'll be happy to write to the commander, you know, here to get that information that you need. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. But my, my colleagues, those who spoke before me, had great questions and the reorganization of these schools. And it is a long time coming and uh, we are seeing a decline. And I appreciate uh, the information you brought to us because one of the questions I had is, where are we seeing this drop in students? Are we finding out that more parents uh, uh, taking their children at a younger age, taking them out of public school and putting them in charter schools or private schools, and then later on putting them in a public school? So we, we can kind of see that, that middle schools are not as, uh, you know, uh, there's not as a decline in population as the elementary level. So the high school, I'm not sure um, why there's a close decline in that, but I think a consultant might help on that, okay? Um, other than that, Mr. Chair, I'm looking forward to the rest of your presentation, and thank you. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Senator Sir Nicholas? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everybody. Good morning, colleagues. I, uh, I'm concerned about uh, when I heard about the decommissioning of schools and the impact it would have on the economy, and not only the econ economy, but the teachers and the staff that have to work at these schools that you might have to decommission. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of concerned about that. And, and uh, as long as, you know, the most prudent thing to do when uh, there's a decline in the population would be to uh, decommission a school. And I think that's, I think that would be in order with what's going on. But at the same time, I'm, I'm concerned about how we're gonna deal with our, you know, the, uh, the implications that may arise. Um, and the other thing was, uh, you know, I used to work at Southern High and uh, the nurse asked me, she says, uh, can we fix the, uh, the uh, air conditioning quicker down there? It's really hot. And, but I just wanted to mention that and put that out there. All right, Miss Joyce, I asked him. <laughs> and then the, the, third, the third thing I have a concern with, and I think it's germane because you did put, uh, put out some testimony, um, is the praxis. Um, I think the praxis is a, has a monopoly on the island. And uh, every time a teacher would fail the praxis, they would have to pay and do it over again. And I think, is, is there an alternative method that was used once before other than the praxis? And is there, is there anything that we can do to mitigate that so that way there's an alternative other than the praxis to certify teachers? I don't know of a current, current methodology, but I tend to agree with you about the praxis. Um, it's a great business if you own the franchise. Um, I don't know that it proves anything with someone's ability to teach. That's, that's very true, yes, sir. And uh, I just wanted to bring that, bring that to light because I work with some uh, teachers who are not certified, but they're really great people. It's just, uh, you know, every time they, they fail the praxis, they would have to take it over again. It costs, it costs money. And I just want to bring, bring that to light. Maybe that uh, topic might be something to consider in the future. So that way we can, we can, we can work together to try to uh, boost our certif certification numbers and maybe uh, the, the, the education, education department can offer an alternative to the praxis. And, and we are, that's why we do have a cohort system in operation where we have folks who have degrees but are not certified to teach yet and we're working with the University of Guam to get them through the program and get them certified. And that precludes the praxis, uh, but it takes a little bit longer. Yes, sir, that's great, that's good news. Because uh, I, 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 I've, I've taken the praxis, thank goodness I passed the first time around, but I, I noticed that some teachers, uh, you know, especially well-meaning ones and really good ones, you know, um, having difficult time with that. And I thank you for that. Um, uh, no, I, I agree on your concern. And you have to remember that, that that exam, along with the SAT and several others, are engineered to, to screen people out, not screen them in. Okay, yes, sir. Yes. And that's how they're used. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and there's also the concern of, uh, you know, um, the downsides, there's something happening in our, in our society and you know, I wanna to get to the bottom of this. It's very important that we also not only look at the numbers that are leaving, but why are they leaving? And uh, maybe if you can present that uh, the next time, if we do have an oversight hearing, why exactly are we losing the numbers? Uh, are they moving off island for certain reasons? Or, or I, I don't like losing people uh, to moving off island. So if, if there's anything that we can do to help bolster the economy or, uh, do anything that we can to keep them here. I'd certainly, you know, try to try to help keep them here. Um, other than that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't have any anything else. Thank you, though. Thank you very much. Sue uh, Senator St. Nicholas, uh, Superintendent. Before you continue with the rest of your presentation, I did want to ask uh, to kind of follow up with Senator St. Nicholas. There was a recent media report that. Uh, stated the uh, Guam Department of Education had over 180 uncertified uh, teachers. Can you can you speak to that before you continue? Those are folks that are in different. St that's the, the, like for example the cohort that I just spoke about. They're not yet certified. They are degreed. We have them in a program. They will be certified. But when we get down to the number that was in the presentation, the 60, we actually are short that many teachers but we have 
capacity and we have a, a way forward to, to solve that problem. So as we're, as we're moving, we're moving teachers from a less crowded environment into a, a, a fully staffed environment, we would fill those vacancies. But we'd, we'd, of all of the people that are working in schools, there are that many that are not certified across, remember, across 24,000 students. It's not, there's 3,000 employees. So there's those, that group of their aides. Some of them are long-term substitutes that have provisional certification. So you're, you're saying that these aren't necessarily the frontline right. teachers the, that are in the classroom. Right, not the frontline teachers, no. Okay. And that those numbers were taken off of a worksheet that we're using to try and okay. track where our people yeah. are. Um, yeah, but I mean, we're being sued for violations of the Adequate Education right, Act, right, and then yeah. one of those, one of the, the uh, tenets in the act is that a we have to have a certified teacher in every class, and so when I hear that we have 180 who aren't, uh, but you're now saying that those aren't necessarily uh, full-time regular teachers. No, they're 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 part-time. You know, okay. we don't. <laughs> no, we don't go out and hire someone full-time permanent that's not certified. Uh, the, the work to get everybody certified, and it's a, it's a real challenge. Uh, but we're we're taking aim at that target, and we're working toward it. And that's why we have we're just getting ready to start yet another cohort of folks who want to be certified that are close to being able to do that. For many of them, it is a matter of two or three courses that they need in professional education on top of their degree, and they're ready to go. Okay, well, uh, before you continue, I just wanted to also just remark uh, generally that we're, we're so deep in these conversations about the, uh, I mean, a massive decline in enrollment, right? And uh, yet we continue to see the discussions on the budget where we're seeing, you know, requests for more more money. So I'm, I'm just going to say what a lot of people are thinking, you know, if, if we are down uh, this significantly in enrollment, then I'm just going to say there are, you know, colleagues in this body who are going to look at that and they're going to say, well, what, how are we justified to give GDOE more money when um, they've had enrollment drop uh, significantly and, and we haven't seen a correlating um, assessment that you said is underway with uh, the staffing uh, level. So, uh, Please continue with the presentation, and then I'm pretty sure we're going to have more questions on the other things. I would ask for a five-minute recess for a break. Sure. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. We'll take. A, we're going to take a two-minute recess. All right. Well, we'll be back uh, with a continuation of this oversight hearing. See you, Ms.
And we're uh, back for a recess. Uh, we still have the rest of the superintendent's uh, presentation, but Soup, I did want to ask uh, because there was a document that was circulating, uh, and this document was uh, taken from the facilities master plan, and it's a, it's a one-sheeter, and it lists the schools, and then it um, lists different, uh, well, there's one that says refurbishment, and then it'll say, oh, this school, recommend this school for refurbishment. Then there's another bracket that says uh, consolidation or closure. And so uh, this document has been circulating and it lists the schools. Uh, for example, I think Southern High is one of the ones that was recommended for uh, possible decommissioning, right? And so I think that the circulation of this document has led a lot of people to believe that um, this current process is an extension of those determinations that were already made previously with the facilities master plan. So it, before we proceed with the presentation, could you ad address that? Are these schools uh, listed um, for consideration in the facilities master plan the same ones that we're looking at with this current process? We're, we're looking at the, that master plan as a starting point. <clears throat> it is a couple years old. Uh, Populations have shifted, and the other thing that we're looking at is the actual enrollment of physical, physical enrollment in schools. So in different parts of the island, and depending on where the growth is, that's, that's a real driving factor in it. And like I said, it's a starting point. We haven't made the decisions yet in terms of where we anticipate, and as I, as I mentioned earlier offline, I'm starting to see development and building in areas that right now there's not much attendance there, but families move in there, that's another story. So we're trying to take all of that into consideration, but that master plan is a starting point. Uh, some of it is, is still valid. Some of it is probably needs to be changed. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, please proceed for real this time with the rest okay, of your presentation. Okay, we're on a slide that said capital improvement projects. Uh, here we are. Okay, so we have uh, a number a number of projects in motion. So FB Leon Guerrero Middle School, uh, the refurbishment projects uh, we have right now a package of eight refurbishment projects that are moving back and forth between the AG's office and our office for modification and updating. But the, that will entail in the neighborhood of $80 million worth of re rehabilitation work on, on other campuses. I can't announce it yet because it's not signed and official uh, by the government, uh, by the governor. F.B. Leon Guerrero uh, is uh, in the design and permitting phase. Um, and we have other projects going on, and that is, uh, you see Lyndon Johnson, Washington, George Washington High School Gymnasium, and that's completed. Uh, except for the uh, the repainting that'll be done after the school year is over, but the construction work is finished. Upi Elementary uh, transformer repairs, and then uh, AC insulation projects are ongoing. We are installing air conditioners across uh, all of our schools, and we have done a significant part of it. And I think we'll go to the next slide. Um, I think we got actually have the numbers. Uh, we've got just over 800 out of 2,000 plus. So here's here's what we have. Uh, the current ones in motion are Ocean View Middle School, Agata Johnson Middle School, JQ San Miguel, and Chief Brody Elementary. That's where the crews are working right now this week. Um, when we take a look at the next slide, There we go. So here's what we are, 866 units. There, we're anticipating in the neighborhood of 2,500 air conditioning units to be installed in the, uh, in the course of the project. It's a just slight, slightly below $10 million contract to do all the air conditioning, all of our campuses. So 866 is 30, 33% completed out of 2,600 that are, in, that are to be installed. Uh, that does not include another contract that we're preparing to do maintenance over time. This includes initial maintenance, but um, 
for the first two years, but we have older equipment that's in place that needs maintenance, and that's a separate contract that we're, so that we have good air conditioned uh, facilities on all of our campuses. Um, with regard to DODEA updates, there's not much new to report here. Uh, the sources are, are not being responsive at all to include the director of DODEA. Uh, was the last person that I've been able to reach out to. Um, the projections that I saw from the from the that were put together show that there'll be significant work around around schools at the fiscal year 28. But before we get to that, it's whatever we have is what we're doing. Uh, I don't anticipate much change from Dodia, and uh, I will go back to my sources there yet again to see if I can get better information. But uh, six months ago, they were very engaged and providing different kinds of options, everything from leasing a facility from us to building their own, and then the decision came out that there would not be any military construction money for schools until FY28. So we'll see where that goes, um, but we're, we're still following that because we're trying to get a real understanding of what's the actual impact gonna be for military families or military related families that are our customer base that will be living in our schools uh, and in our communities. Um, it's now time to talk about Head Start. So there is the resident expert young lady right Hello. there. Hi, um, my name is Angelina LePay. I'm currently the social services supervisor with Head Start and the acting program director. Um, so as you know, our um, corrective action period ended in the beginning of March. The feds were here that same week um, and have um, submitted their reports. So what I have for you today is just an update because we have not met since um, before that March visit <clears throat> to kind of bring you up to speed with what we've done and where we, we're at with our corrective action. Um, so first of all, for active supervision, um, if you recall, the initial finding was that we, as a program, did not ensure that all staff and consultants followed appropriate practices to keep children safe during all activities. Our corrective action plan um, action was that we conducted additional training on active supervision for all program staff to include our central office team, um, and that was to ensure that there's a culture of safety embedded within the program at all levels. We did intensive mentoring of our teaching staff who were identified as in need of additional um, strategies. And then we went out and provided individual support to the teaching staff that um, emphasized the active supervision during transitions and outdoor play because those were the areas of primary concern. Since then, um, we continue our ongoing monitoring and our data has shown overall improvement and consistent implementation of the active supervision strategies. This was also noted by the federal review team when they came on site, that they could see the difference and the um, consistent implementation when they went to the classrooms. <clears throat> Our next finding was ongoing monitoring. That particular finding said that the program did not establish and implement a system of effective ongoing oversight and correction. Um, basically to ensure that any quality and compliance issues were addressed immediately or as quickly as possible. Since then, our corrective action was to finalize our policies and procedures, and we trained all staff in this. Um, we implemented an, uh, a system of monthly site visits by content area specialists. These were things that we were doing many, many years ago that we then reinstituted and um, fine-tuned. So we developed specific tools um, related to the standards in the area that we thought were of utmost concern. Our monthly site visits ensure that we gather the data in the classroom as well as through our database. And um, we've expanded it to include analysis and aggregation of the data, monthly meetings with these content specialists, and then a report that goes to the Guam Education Board and Policy Council every, every month um, to ensure that they're on top of our program planning and quality improvement efforts. 
Um, the next finding was that facilities um, should be free from pollutants, hazards, and toxins. This was specifically because there was no evidence at the time of the monitoring of lead testing of the water in Head Start facilities. So that was the primary finding. Our corrective action since then is that we did complete testing of the water in all Head Start classrooms and restroom sinks, water fountains that our children use, as well as the cafeteria sinks. All but two sites were identified as below the action level established by EPA for lead. The two schools that were um, positive for lead in the cafeteria were JM Guerrero and Machinano. Um, those cafeterias were addressed. The sinks were isolated, the faucets changed, they were retested, EPA um, inspected it and certified them for use. So all the water is free from lead right now. <clears throat> We also did um, testing of the paint, although that was not an identified finding. We tested all the paint in all centers, which were built before 1978 for lead. Um, there were one, two, four schools that tested positive, Finnegazen, Price, Truman, and Weddingal, um, <clears throat> for certain areas. And so in those schools, what we did is if the doors or cabinet cabinets were identified as positive, we removed and replaced them. We purchased um, lead encapsulating paint and we addressed all the other areas because um, our contractor had told us that the state of those facilities was such that um, it just needed that encapsulating paint. Moving forward, we will continue to test the water annually since that was the primary concern. All newly identified Head Start facilities will be tested for lead-based paint if they were built before 1978. <clears throat> and then those centers which did test positive, we will continue to test it annually for paint to ensure that it's still safe um, and still en encapsulated properly. <clears throat> um, the next finding was that the outdoor play areas should be kept safe through an ongoing system of preventative maintenance. And this is kind of the conversations we've been having this morning about maintenance and ensuring that our facilities are um, up to par for future generations. So the corrective action that we took was we finalized our policies and procedures. We trained the staff that are um, identified as being part of this process, not only the teaching staff, but our maintenance staff, our content area specialists to ensure that when they go out there to do their monitoring, they know what they're looking for. Um, <clears throat> the system of monitoring that we developed with our content specialists includes the indoor and outdoor learning environments. Um, we have collaborated very closely with not only the school principals and staff, but also GDOE facilities and maintenance <clears throat> and ensured that the system of maintenance service requests is embedded into our own Head Start system for tracking. Designated playground spaces were enclosed with fencing to address safety concerns. That was an immediate concern of the Office of Head Start and was done prior to the visit. <clears throat> For those schools who um, were not able to be utilized by the time the feds came, they had an alternate play space which was acceptable by the feds at that time. Um, we do have our invitation for bid for the playground improvement project that was submitted to the Office of Attorney General. Um, it was sitting there for some time waiting to be reviewed. Um, since then, it has been returned to procurement for some minor modifications. Um, that is being done and then it will be resubmitted, um, if not today, then before the end of the week to the AG for their review. Um, at the end of the project period, all schools will have an enclosed playground with um, apparatus, a trike path, and a shade structure. Um, so we're looking at all of those those things being in included no matter what school it is. The next finding was the background check and the finding was that um, the program did not obtain a criminal record check which included fingerprint um, basically through the FBI and that it was not updated every five years. So since then we have finalized our memorandum of, of agreement between GDOE and the Judiciary of Guam um, to ensure that we have a clear process for obtaining it it is a very quick process. Um, our, we refer people, we send the payment. Within 24 hours of getting their scanned fingerprints, um, they send us an email, uh, send an email to our EEO officer 
notifying us whether that person has passed. <clears throat> we have fin finalized our policies and procedures in collaboration with human resources and train the staff that are involved in that with our office. And we have implemented a system so that we can monitor compliance and be able to assist HR with reminding staff when they're due for renewal. We know that HR is overseeing these thousands of DOE employees and to ensure that this is not a problem in the future, we have our internal system where we assist in monitoring those who are due for renewal. All of our current staff and interns, including um, school aides that have been assigned to provide paraeducator support to Head Start children with certified disabilities, um, have completed their background check with fingerprinting. <clears throat> we have had some recent hires that went through this process, so we know that it works um, and that it is being implemented consistently. And to summarize what happens next, which is the burning question for everyone, is that um, the report that was provided by the Office of Head Start Review Team was completed and submitted um, to the Office of Head Start in DC. It is going through their internal control process. Um, they have told us that there is a minimum of 45 days before we will hear back. Um, so we're looking at any time after April 22nd. Um, that's probably the date that we'll start looking at our email twice, two, three, five times a day, trying to find out what's going on. <clears throat> But until then, we're kind of just waiting. Um, also, we have, I just wanted to bring to your attention that we have submitted our grant funding. Um, we received our notice of non-competitive grant application for the next five-year cycle. That was submitted as required by April 1st. Um, that will fund Head Start for the next five years. There is also a um, grant available for Head Start and Early Head Start expansion. It is a competitive grant estimating 60 awards nationwide, including the Outer Pacific area in Hawaii. <clears throat> and the total funding for that is $102 million. Um, we will be submitting an application for that. Um, it is due May 14th. Um, in the meantime, we are also uh, working on either embedding the um, one-time program improvement funds into the expansion fund, expansion grant, or writing separately for that. And if you recall, during our last oversight hearing, this was the funds that we need to address the shared spaces of those awnings at the identified schools. Uh, Chief Brody, CL Titano, DL Perez, GM Guerrero, PC Lujan. Um, we are also still looking to ensure that all of the concerns at the schools with the shared restrooms have been addressed and if there are any um, anything remaining that we can try and apply for funding for those uh, schools and with that that's our head start update I'm open to answering any questions you might have okay All right, I think my colleagues want to ask uh, some questions of uh, Vice Chair, Senator Duenas. You're good? Okay. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly appreciate the efforts that have been put in place, particularly with regards to the background checks. I think mm -hmm. we recall not too long ago an incident where there was a teacher up at, um, I think it was UP Elementary School, um, that molested not just one, but I think two children. I think there, Mr. Chairman, you recall this individual had been I guess had a complaint filed against them prior, uh, yet they were still in the school and they reoffended another child. Um, and according at least to the reports that were made available to us, uh, this, this teacher was able to take this child to an area near the nurse's room or the nurse's office where it was not visible to other individuals. So do you have a protocol when children are not in the presence, a visible presence of everyone? Um, are there more than one adult present so that we can ensure the safety of that child so that type of incident that happened mm -hmm. doesn't happen again right. to it? Especially, you know, I think for all of us and for those of you that work with these children, you have children of your own. I mean, that's got to be the worst nightmare. Uh, and these innocent children have no idea, mm -hmm. have no way of protecting or defending themselves. And when they look at someone who's in a position of authority that they're supposed to respect and is supposed to be there to take care and protect them, harms them. Uh, you know, you lose a lot of faith in the system. 
So in, how has that changed, or was that the requirement prior so, that was not put in place in that? I mean, I know we can't do in, you know, individual cases, uh -huh. but I that just referenced that because that's um, been the most recent public issue brought forth. That particular teacher you're talking about uh, was not a Head Start staff. Okay. But, well, um, irrelevant, but they were, yes. they were in your but school just, system, you know, right? They, they worked they, in your school. I'm not, I didn't yes. say they were Head Start just, staff yes. at all. No, 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 no. I know you they didn't. They worked at the school. I just want to make sure if any of our Head Start parents are listening, okay. that they know that that wasn't a Head Start mm -hmm. staff. So um, Head Start's policy, our federal regulations are that there must always be two staff present. Um, children are never left alone with a volunteer. And um, how do you implement that? I mean, I, I, I hear all these beautiful presentations that right. we get here. We get a lot of them weekly, <laughs> but the actual implementation is not always there. I mean, how do you, how do you, who's ensuring, who's monitoring, who's checking? You know, you have a lot of children in the school to take care of. How, how is, how is that enforced? Right. So um, we assign two Head Start staff at all centers. If someone calls out, um, our central office staff is a substitute that goes out. Um, in the meantime, if it's like a last minute thing, the school will step in and send their staff to assist. Um, it is in our procedures, as I said, that they're never left alone with a volunteer. Um, and we must maintain a ratio of one staff to every 10, child, 10 children. Um, so if, for instance, at the end of the day, the children are dismissed and a child comes back um, because there was no one at the bus stop to pick them up, um, and one of those staff have to go out and take their car and do a home visit to look for the family, then the teacher, let's say, who's remaining with the child will typically take them to the office and kind of just hang out there while they're waiting. Um, we do... <clears throat> We do our monthly monitoring. Um, it is not um, scheduled with the teaching staff. Like they know we try to come within the first two weeks. They don't know when we're gonna be coming and that's because you know, we wanna go at various times of the day, different days of the week, um, so that we truly see what's happening in our classrooms and ensuring that they're following the procedures, the policies um, that they've been trained on. Um, so that's something that we monitor in that way. And you mentioned that your most recent hires went through this review. I know we're looking at standardizing the requirements government-wide, not just for DOE, but any, any individual that works with regards to the safety of the most vulnerable, be it yes. our children or our elderly. And it's a sad reality of our life. I, yeah. I don't understand it, but it's a reality that we have to deal with. And we're wanting to ensure there are more good people out there, and I remind myself there are more good people out there than bad, but I'll tell you one bad person just really can do a lot of damage, particularly, yes. like I said, for those that are not in a position to protect themselves. So mm -hmm. you've had no problem going through this review process and coordinating? Right, so everyone, all of our staff and interns completed the background check with fingerprinting and passed. And then since then, we've interviewed for vacant positions. Um, there was one person who did not pass mm -hmm. and was not um, recommended for hire, okay. and that was it. And so that's how we know that they're following it. Uh, HR is following the procedure that they helped to um, develop with us. Mm -hmm. And um, everything is, as, has worked out fine with it. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I know we're going to get into the physical maintenance of the buildings, but since we're bringing up elementary schools, I drive by Harry Truman Elementary School like five days a week, <laughs> sometimes six, depending on what's <laughs> going on down south that I have to go to. And I see that playground that is inaccessible. There's, you know, what remnants left of safety tape around the monkey bars and the swings and things that I know children would love to be able to play during their recess hours. I don't know if there's any other playground facility except for what is on the main road there maybe, I don't know. Uh, but what's the status of things like that? Because it's been there like that and in that condition for quite some time and we're almost mm -hmm. completing another school year and right. you know those, those play facilities are not readily available for those children to play when they mm -hmm. have recess. So um, where I are we with that? I can't speak to the playgrounds on the lower level uh -huh. that is heading kind of towards Hyundai, mm -hmm. but our Head Start classroom is on the upper level mm -hmm. which is closer to that um, three-way stop up there. And um, our playground is open for the children. Before we, um, when we were identifying the fencing needs and the playground needs for the IFB, we did speak to the acting principal at the time about the possibility of 
relocating our Head Start classroom to the lower level and then building a playground down there which the entire school population could more easily access. Mm -hmm. However, at that time, there was no room identified down there that we were able to use. Um, they were um, offering us some rooms that needed to be, that had lost its roof and needed more, in, more repairs than we were able to do before the on-site federal review. So we were not able to um, move down there and then identify that site. So what's the status? Is it just going to be left as it is? I mean, if you're not going to use it, if it's not going to be used, is it going to be dismantled and removed? I mean... Um, like I said, those aren't Head Start playgrounds, so yeah. I'd have to defer to the superintendent okay. and the principal for I'm that I'm just asking because, okay, but we'll ask when we get to you, Mr. <laughs> superintendent, because yeah. it is an elementary school. Right. And it's been sitting there, no, I know over the school year, it's been longer than the school year, it's been in that condition, so... Do you know in particular what the status? It's just it's it's a very visible introduction to the school, and so I don't think it's kind of message we want. I'm, I am familiar with the with that playground and several others that mm -hmm. need to be replaced or removed. <clears throat> that's a matter of programming the funding that we have, and that's part of the process that we're going to be going through with our remaining ARP funding, that we can find the most impactful project on each of the schools that's not scheduled for rehabilitation, mm -hmm. and take care of that. Playgrounds are one of them and we have several that are in need of removal at the very least and certainly replacement. And if, if you're going to address replacement, I think that's wonderful, but in the interim, can it simply be taken down? You, you don't have the ability to go out there and have maintenance people remove and take down those structures? I mean, we're talking monkey bars and... We have, we have maintenance capacity. Right now it's committed to passing school inspections. Mm -hmm. And so we can work that into the priorities and certainly through the summer probably be able to get that done. And you can't contract that out? Yes, we can. I just, that's, and Mr. Chair, I just want to bring this up. And again, it's not, oh, gee, all the things that are wrong. But, you know, let's deal with the realities of what's happening. I'm just kind of concerned because if you have the money available and yet these things have been sitting for over a year or longer. I mean, these kids have gone over a school year where that, playground has existed as it has. Are you not able to do smaller contracts? I mean, I, even I'm a little concerned about these big master contracts because I don't know the contractor can simultaneously do all this work at once if you're only giving it to one company. And I have no connections. I have no financial interest in any company. Um, but how effective are they going to be if you have one master contractor doing everything versus can you get smaller contracts to do these smaller jobs? So because I, I still have an issue of concern of wondering if DOE is just so big that it can't move effectively. It's like the private schools during COVID. Private schools were able to get back, at least my child was able to get back directly into class learning a lot sooner, months and months sooner than Department of Education. And so I worry about that because I just, when you see things like that sitting for so long and they're not being addressed, why not? Are you able to get a smaller contractor to go out and do the work if you have the money available to do it? That's, <clears throat> that's not an area that we've attempted to address at this point, but we certainly can. It's just one school. It's one example of something that's just very no, I, visible. I understand. So I... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, yeah, I agree with the points that uh, she's raised. My, my kids go up at DLP, and, you know, I don't think it was just this year. I think this playground material has been roped off for a couple years. Um, Juan M. Guerrero, I don't even want to go uh, to the area where the temporary classrooms were. And we brought this up in the beginning of the term, uh, the debris from the temporary classrooms that were um, bulldozed uh, that was sitting up there for a year. I, I mean, is it still up there? Maybe we should get the guard involved. Let me uh, ask uh, my friends at the guard if they can um, help out with this uh, playground uh, issue because, yeah, I mean, <laughs> kids need to play and the uh, equipment's uh, broken down. And it's also, I, I think it's, um, it's depressing when we go to these schools and you look out at the playground and it's all roped off. And uh, the kids, I mean, they're playing soccer and uh, the administrators are getting real creative. I'm not saying the kids aren't getting the play time, but again, uh, it's, it goes back to that curb appeal, right? When you show up at the school, you want to have pride in, in what you see. And a lot of times when you're looking at broken down uh, playgrounds with the caution tape all around, I mean, it looks like a crime scene. 
that's what we do with crime scenes, you know. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, let me go back to this, uh, your air conditioning. Um, 2,600 uh, air conditioners are to be installed, right? That's correct. Okay. And so as of March 28th, 866, so 33% or, or a third have been uh, completed, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, is this just one vendor? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, likewise, um, is this just one brand of air conditioning or several brands? Several brands and several sizes, depending on the, okay. the engineering okay. for the specific project. Okay. And, and the reason why I was asking whether there's several brands, because each manufacturer will have uh, a, a different manufacturer's warranty and the length of terms and conditions of the warranty. Does this, uh, the air conditioning uh, contract uh, come with a service contract as well? It does. Okay. Is the, the vendor and the service contractor the same? Company? Yes, it is. Okay. So we can be assured then that we have a service contract that all 20, 2,600 units to be installed because we have a service contract. So we can be assured then that with the service contract that the uh, all air conditioners that are installed will adhere to that manufacturer's terms and conditions. That's correct. Okay. With a service contract. This, that's there. So there, there shouldn't be any excuse why a unit or two or whatever um, is not adhering to the particular um, air conditioning manufacturer's um, terms and conditions, right? It's the first part's warranty, right? Yes, yeah, so there's uh, two things. Sorry, uh, Nick Cruz, CIP. Uh, so there's two things. First, there's a manufacturer warranty, mm -hmm. and then there's a company warranty. Okay. Uh, after those two, there is also a five-year preventive maintenance, which is also part of the contract, right? Okay. And um, those are just for units that have strictly been replaced, right? Um, five-year preventive maintenance would include, of course, cleaning of the air filters, a simple servicing of uh, package units and, and split units. And, and, and basically, that's just the one of the terms and conditions of the manufacturer, basically, is that you replace the filters and, and clean it periodically and things like that. Correct. So... For instance, we do have some new units that uh, over the course of two weeks have gone down, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the contractor would have to come back, and of course it's part of their warranty, to either fix the discrepancy or if the unit is just um, completely not working, then they would straight up replace the unit as part of their warranty uh, okay. uh, terms and conditions. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure that we're, we're keeping tabs on every unit that, oh, that oh yes. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. So um, the principals are extremely good at telling me that, hey, um, room one has a new uh, AC unit that was installed two weeks ago. It's no longer working. Can you send a contractor back? And the contractor has been um, very quick at sending a, a separate team to address those, those mm -hmm. units. Okay. Like, likewise, let me, let me ask you, because we have summer coming up, and not all the schools, again, I mean, schools will be out for a while. Um, do the non-operation of air conditioning or air conditioners that will be turned off for that, that period of time, would that nullify some of the contract then? I, I mean, basically some of the terms because of non-use maybe for a couple months and then they turn them on and all of a sudden they don't work and the manufacturer will come back and say, hey man, because you weren't, you know, you didn't turn it on for the past two months or something like that. I mean, I'm just wondering what some of the terms and conditions are because we do, you know, we're coming in on, uh, you know, from full usage to, to maybe turning it off and then it won't come back on for a couple months. And I'm just wondering how, how the manufacturer would, would view that from full usage to being dormant for a month or two. I, I don't have the answer for that. I know that's um, a, special, uh, a special case. Um, however, the schools are aware. So for a few of our classrooms, most of our classrooms, uh, we're talking split units. They are fitted with two split units. The reason being is because we want to expand the lifetime of the units, right? So one month you have a, a split unit on, the next month that unit is turned off, and then the other unit uh, would be turned on. Um, but as far as summer school, right, uh, the units that are stagnant for those few months, I, I, I really don't see uh, any issue of, you know, trying to get the warranty involved in 
for if the unit were not to be working right, mm -hmm. just just to see the contractor is able to sure. provide those repairs sure. if if okay. needed, right? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Luhan. Senator Duenas, did you have any questions for this portion? Not on this portion, oh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Tidegui. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quick, um, uh, how many do you, how many people do you have um, employed in your maintenance office? I'm looking at our F and M uh, manager back there. He's saying around 51, and that's also inclusive of our in office in. Uh, office staff and uh, the warehouse. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions. I have. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, I just had uh, Miss Angelina. Are there vacancies in the Head Start uh, program? Are you are you able to staff uh, adequately with the personnel that you have? Um, we are fully staffed. However, we do have uh, vacant aid positions. Um, as we expanded Head Start from four hours to the duration of the school day, we added additional school aides to support that. Um, we have maybe about six or seven aid vacancies okay. in that area that we are still um, interviewing for. We do have a couple teacher vacancies, um, recent resignations uh, or retirements, and we have some other um, key personnel, you know, as you know, our program director is still vacant. We do have our health coordinator and IT coordinator that um, recently resigned. Those need to be filled, um, that kind of stuff. Do those uh, vacancies uh, affect our ability to uh, manage uh, the kids, you know, based on the federal guidelines? No, because our central office staff are deployed to support the classrooms. So we always have two Head Start staff fully trained in there. Okay, so go apply uh, to be a Head Start aide if you guys are out there uh, go watching. Go apply. Yeah. Uh, Soup, on the AC contract, now, uh, I know I don't need to refresh your memory, but there was a lot of noise made about this uh, vendor and this contract, uh, you know, back in uh, January, and I'd written you a letter about uh, some of the benchmarks that the contract, the, the vendor was supposed to meet as per the contract, and one of those benchmarks was, I think, uh, you know, by a certain number of months into the contract, they were supposed to have installed uh, I want to say a quarter of uh, the units. So when I look at the numbers that you're providing, uh, they're up to 33%, but uh, according to the math in my mind, they are a little bit behind. But for the most part, have we gotten past some of the issues? Because I still I still get concerns. Uh, for example, I met with you on this, Machinao Now, now uh, Elementary. Uh, I'm getting a lot of concerns from uh, parents of, and staff at that school. And then uh, let me just share this concern with you that was shared with me from a, I'm a parent of a student who attends a Stumbo Middle School from what my son has said uh, that there's still some classrooms without working ACs. From my understanding, the school is functional and is ready for the kids to go back and utilize the campus. But due to the lack of air cons in some classrooms, when will that happen for them as well? As Stumbo and Benaventi Middle Schools are part of the cohort schedules, slowly I'm seeing those who have cohort schedules this school year are going back to their schools and going every day. When will it be uh, their turn? And so I remember I met with you about uh, some of the AC issues and schools were saying that they had heard teams were at other areas but hadn't been to, well, specifically like uh, Machinano. So could you just uh, explain that? And then also, what is the situation with Estumbo Middle and, and uh, Benaventi? Estumbo Middle and Benaventi are still doubled up. Um, the initial plan we had to put in uh, splits in part of that Estumbo building, have been overridden. The folks from, from the Jeff group, uh, the Jeff group are here on island now, and they've been working with the Adeloupe to work out the process to transfer funding into the maintenance pot to be able to fund <coughs> A major large unit installation, especially for Stimbo Middle School and for also for Okudu High School. I don't know the outcome of those meetings. They were con they were continuing on as of yesterday afternoon. I don't have new information on that. So now, Lachinano, is there is there an ability to uh, when these? I don't even legally know, but it, it seems like we have an issue with a lot of these uh, lease schools. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a renter. When my aircon breaks, uh, the landlord's responsible for it, yet we're now in a situation where 
uh, we're having to foot the bill for a lot of these uh, repairs, installations of ACs. And then what's frustrating for, for me is um, we hear from students and, and staff who are, on the, who are um, being housed or hosted on these different campuses, and then we hear that they don't have the same ability to access the facilities that, uh, for example, teachers who are, um, you know, for example, Ukudu, right? You got, I get complaints from teachers at FB who say, oh, we don't get keys, we don't get this, we don't get access. Then I hear from the students that they're not able to use the facilities. And so um, that just bothers me because we're, ser we're serving the same population, you know what I mean, the Guam Department of Education. And so I'm not sure legally what the issues are with the contracts, but, you know, just be mindful next time you enter into a contract. Uh, to be aware of these things and to make sure that we have all the people at the table so it's not this situation where uh, we're having to involve, uh, you know, for example, the office of the governor or, or uh, any other entities who I feel might not have a good grasp on what GDOE needs. We have three different lease facility structures and the maintenance provisions in all three leases are different and they are all predating me by quite a number of years. Uh, that with, with regard to these four campuses, there was provision to put aside up to about $2 million for these kinds of repairs. <clears throat> the leaseholder has expended all of those funds. That's why we're able to reopen three of the schools. Um, the last one, uh, the, the cost is approaching $4 million to replace the the heavy duty large air conditioning units. That process was in place to try to negotiate the transfer of funds through our maintenance fund that was allocated to do the storm repair to the lease so that that work could be done. I don't know if that's been accomplished or not. That's what they were working on. That's why we paused putting in split air conditioners in a temporary basis to reopen that school. So. As of, as of this meeting, I don't know the answer to that. I'm hoping that that was done and it's a process of moving the, the funds over so that the, the leaseholder can work directly with their contractor and get this expedited. Are there issues uh, with these leases? Uh, you know, when, when, for example, in a double session, um, are students from other uh, schools and campuses being, um, are they able to use the facilities just like uh, you know, any other kid who goes to school there? With regard to the lease itself, they're able to, to use the facilities to the extent that the two administrations can work out the schedules. That does entail an extra cost to us for maintenance and, and especially for janitorial service. So there is an extra cost for the use of the facility and there's also <clears throat> extra transportation costs too because of the extra load for DPW. Thank you. What's the latest on the uh, George Washington gym uh, air conditioning? Uh, GW gym, I believe that's a 15, there's four 15 ton package units. Those are expected to arrive, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the next month or month or a half. So um, I've already slated those 15 ton package units for G GW high school. We've been doing extensive work to the gym, of course, your structural repair. Uh, in the coming months, we'll do the interior painting. Last would be, uh, of course, the ACs, and um, hopefully by next school year, right? Yeah, I hope so, because I was up at GW home. for Vester Moore, and I told them, hey, we're going to get your aircon on back by the start of the school year, so. Yeah, yeah. knock on wood, correct. Okay, uh, and then there was one more issue before you continue. Uh, Southern High School, I've uh, been approached by a lot of people at Southern High School about the flagpole. Um, their flagpole's uh, well, it's broken, and it's in an area where, because we had tried to consider could we rent a lift and we'll just go down there, and, and but I don't know how we can access uh, that because it's up some stairs and stuff. So have you, or just what's the status on that? I'm familiar with Southern High School. There's also another school, um, Upi Elementary, leading flagpole rate. Um, to be honest, I, I have no idea how to address that. Um, I know the flagpole is uh, deep in the ground, right? So we would have to either find a way to strengthen the, uh, stra uh, strength, straighten the flagpole if possible, or completely remove and, and replace it. So of course, more assessment for, for those two schools will, will take place. 
Thank you. Thank you. And these questions I get, you know, people text me, email me, WhatsApp me, send me the social media, and I always say, hey, send me your questions, and I'll ask the OE. So thank you. Uh, Superintendent, please proceed uh, with the rest of the presentation. Sido Spasi. Okay, we're looking at the slide for public health sanitation compliance, and we're continuing to work on that. These, the slide in front of you shows <clears throat> the next three that we expect to do, uh, to, to do those inspections. We've had teams on site working to bring those, two, those three schools up to standard um, and get them ready for that inspection. And the model we're using is as we prepare a school, we have a team of two to four full-time folks that are on campus looking for all of the things that public health is looking for to make sure that they're repaired and in place. Uh, and as I said before, now we're down to the schools that need a lot more work. So those teams are there longer, four to six weeks rather than just a couple of weeks. Um, so anyway, we're looking at OMS coming up starting on the, on the 15th of April and then uh, Attica Johnson on the 29th and then uh, Jose Rios on the 6th of May. So that we've already completed a number of inspections that, uh, that had kids off campus or in alternating situations. Um, and so the Tamuning Elementary School is back to, to full operation. Atacau Elementary is back in full operation. Inarahan Middle School is back in full operation. And Jose Rios is back in, in, in full operation. So we were able to get all of those back together. The last one remaining is Estumbo Middle School that's still, still doubled up. And like I said, that's, uh, uh, I don't have the current information beyond that because it's current as of today. The, uh, the question has been brought, brought, uh, brought up a couple of times about where are we posting the information about inspections. And so the slide that you have here has got the pull down uh, for that information that's on our website. As we get the inspections done, we put the full report up so the community is able to see that. Um, so that it, so the, it, when you pull up that slide, it, you get some color coding for the schools, and it, it really indicates the green is highlighted indicates schools that have been serviced by the AC contract. Yellow is the ones that are uh, currently being done, and then there's uh, all schools that are in yellow are anticipated to be completed within the next week to, to week and a half. So that should be helpful in, the, in that regard. This slide is the school inspection status report and this gets updated on a regular basis, but actually reflects the dates the schools are inspected, the grade they got, um, and that's in addition to the reports that are already posted online. So we, we are staying on that schedule and working to get it all done. Uh, the next slide is uh, the schools that have been completed and shows you the score that they have. Uh, and some of them have been inspected twice, so there's two scores. And that says of April 7th. So uh, we, like I said, we have two more this month and then another one at the beginning of May. So the, G, the, the DOE and GPD partnership to address school safety, there's a number of steps that we've taken. Um, and I, I met recently with the, uh, the chief and his entire staff, which was a very rewarding conversation. Uh, they're definitely our partners to the extent that their workload will allow them to be. Um, one of the things that's been, been very, very helpful is the village safety officers have all been, also been spending time on our secondary campuses along with um, random patrol units stopping on each of the high school campuses. And I will have to say that with that, just that level of intervention going on, the situations of instances of violence have been drastically reduced. It's been very helpful. And we're very grateful for that support. And also when we do have an instance where we need response, the GPD response has been very, very quick. Um, <clears throat> So they're to be commended for that. We are scheduling after active shooter training for our staff this summer, uh, July 8th through the 12th, and it will train approximately 400 staff members. We don't ever want to have to use this training, but we certainly have to have it in place. 
Um, we are also requesting in our grant application, this SRO1 is to actually have uniformed sworn police officers as SROs. If we can get the grant funding, that's how we will support that. GPD is in support of the idea as well. Um, in the meantime, we have those, the, our SROs, our attendance officers. There's a, quite a distinct difference. One is tracking attendance. One is also to be trained as a, as, and licensed as a, a sworn peace officer is a different, different structure, but it's very, very effective. We're continuing the DARE program, drug assistance re, uh, resistance education for our, your elementary students. There's a project youth summer program that gives students and mentors a goal of instilling good decision making and leadership values. <laughs> good decisions we can all use for sure. Uh, junior police cadet program is a, is a, is a great asset. Crime Stoppers is still a, one of our programs that we like to we like to use and, and encourage folks to to uh, engage in. And then there's active collaboration with school administrators to investigate and address online threats. We've had a number of them over the, the course of this year, but I have to say that the resources through law enforcement, through GPD and other agencies on the islands have been very effective and very quickly identifying the folks who perpetrate that and, and bringing them into the civil justice environment. Um, so that's, I don't wanna go into the details of it, but it's effective and it works. And the more we can minimize that threat, the better. Um, both agencies um, are members of the Lieutenant Governor Safety Task Force. So we're, we're, there's a lot of communication going on and, and load sharing when it comes to that part of the work. Um, that concludes everything up and to including special education and Mr. Babauta gets to do that part. Good morning, Senators. So on the agenda that you had wanted us to prepare for, you wanted us to discuss the special ed aid status, the IEP status, busing update, and vacancy and recruitment. So next slide. So this is a part B update regarding the aid status and that's our uh, school age kids. We also obviously oversee the, the um, early intervention program. But if you look here, we have current positions that are filled 295. Out of those 295, 105 of them are full-time aides and 190 of them are limited term full-time aides. So that's a yearly contract. Um, that we, we go year to year. And then if you look at the funding source, 19 out of the uh, 295 are funded locally and 276 are funded under the Special Education Part B grant. 19 students are expected to graduate this school year although our special needs students can stay up to their 22nd birthday if they need more assistance and uh, are not ready to transition out. And one of the numbers for you to look at here on the bottom right is just within the last few months, we have had an increase of 20 additional requests for uh, paraeducators. In the past, we've called them one-to-one -one aids, but we're really trying to move away from that concept and look more towards adult assistance and looking at ways where we could uh, maximize the use of our paraeducators. So I know that there, we have some folks from special education in back of me, and then we also have a bunch of folks from, that are administrators out at the schools. So on any of our large uh, activities that we require um, any big, decision making, what we're doing these days is we're ensuring that we get full input and participation from the stakeholders, primarily at the school level, which are the administrators. So uh, when we're making decisions as to 
um, you know, next steps with our programming, how do we utilize these aids, how do we access that service. Uh, we we uh, call, uh, called our uh, stakeholders in so that we can uh, connect with them. So if you look at the numbers here, 380 students are requiring aids based on their um, current IEP, which is their individual educational plan. And that shows a shortfall of 85 right now. Typically, um, you know, we're asked how is that covered? Each school administrator makes that determination based on the educational team, and they cover down with what resources they have internally. Uh, so that's how they ensure the safety for, for those students. Um, we are, we did open 50 part-time positions recently. Uh, I believe that later this week we're doing interviews. Only 11 applicants. So we're, we're really having a hard time getting uh, folks interested in, in coming out. So we are trying to figure out what is the rationale behind that. Is it because of the type of work? If, is it, uh, you know, um, just the workforce in, in general? We did work with the Department of Labor and GCC, and we're looking to do a boot camp for paraeducators. So we're looking to have that go online by the summer. And what we're looking at doing is training and also retraining. And the great thing about that is the Department of Labor is looking to uh, help us to get, I, I know at one point we were talking about every uh, government employee or, at, or every employee at DOE getting, uh, for instance, first aid certified. So that's something that's built into that uh, boot camp. So that's something we're, we're really looking forward to. I'll go ahead and stop here so I can address the aid questions and then we can go on to the, to the next topic. Senator Lujan, did you have any questions? Senator Brown? Senator Tidegui? Okay, I, I guess I just had a, a couple. Could you maybe explain, uh, Mr. Tom, what is the difference between a one-to-one -one aid and a paraeducator? So when we look at student needs, uh, I'll, I'll maybe use an example of a more severe student who requires a hip to hip, somebody right next to them, possibly feeding issues, so they might be fed through a tube, they might have mobility issues, so they're gonna require somebody for safety with them at all times. And in the past, what's happened is we have students who maybe require assistance 50% of the time or 60% of the time, and on the other um, times of the day, whether it's academics or uh, behavioral, they're, they're okay. What ends up happening though is the school team will determine we need a, a paraeducator or a one-to-one, -one. we kind of use them synonymously, but we're really trying to elevate the position, trying to utilize these uh, because they are paraprofessionals, you know, these are, are folks that we're uh, entrusting our students with, so we want to be able to utilize them for behavior, we want to be able to utilize them to help with the academics. But if you could look back, you know, maybe back in time, we used to have a paraeducator attached to maybe a class, and that paraeducator would help out, you know, and we have that concept now with the teaching assistant, right? So we're really looking at different ways where we can maybe maximize the pool of 295 that we have so that we can really effectuate the most change. So. It's just been a, a, a change in the, the, the title is actually school aid, but we use one-to-one uh, -one interchangeably with paraeducator, but we're really trying to you know, move towards that paraeducator model and, and move away from one-to-one -one because not all of our students require one-to-one -one hip to hip assistance. We do have some kids in the past that have actually required two-to-one. So it really is based on need, right. um, and, and that's kind of how we, we go from there. Okay, uh, when you talked about trouble recruiting, are these uh, largely the part-time uh, positions or are you also having uh, trouble? Because what I get uh, from people is uh, the yearly, right, the limited term, yearly thing, there's just no sustainability. I don't even, do they get benefits? Well. That's just what I hear from right. why so, they're not interested in the position because there's not a lot of security and, and the compensation. So I support the educator, the paraeducator of boot camp because I, I do think we need to level up and uh, compensate accordingly. But do you think that those yeah. are, that's why we're having these issues? Uh, definitely. So historically, over the last maybe 15 years, we've had 
part-time employees, not, not they're limited term part-time employees. So when students are not in school, they're not employed. So if it's a holiday or summer, unless there's a requirement for training or the student has an extended school year, those paraeducators would not be employed. So two years ago, we were able to shift some the funding and finances around and we were able to get at least a limited term full-time slot where uh, they would get benefits, they would earn leave, uh, but again, it was only on a year-to-year -year contract. So in order for us, and I'm in full support, if we were to look at having these employees be permanent, again, that would cost, you know, um, a little bit of extra money. You know, what really kind of put us uh, in the hole was the 22% increase. Uh, so that really has caused us to really um, shuffle our funds around and, and try to figure out how we're going to uh, continue that concept there. So these are things that we've internally been having discussions with. And then, you know, I know that at, at some point we're going to have to uh, have these discussions with you. So as you could see, 276 are from the federal funding and only 19 come out of local. And I saw in the budget proposal that you're requesting an additional 40. Is that you under the local funds? Uh, those are spread out through uh, out with, with, the, with the school. So the difference is we have some school aides based on the, the contract with the board union that, um, or the, with that uh, are based on, you know, they're regular school aides, so they're there for supervision. You can use them for... Uh, like subbing a class, mm. you can use them in many different ways. For our special education population, they can only be used to work with kids with special needs. So you're not going to see them uh, bush cutting or water blasting yeah. unless it directly impacts the student that they're, they're working with. Yeah, I think we definitely, uh, I mean, it's a worthy investment, right? We have to find a way to permanize uh, these positions. And what I think keeps people, the ones who are coming back, what keeps them coming back, it's not the pay or the benefits. They don't get the increases annually like uh, permanent employees do, but it's really because they love the job. And, uh, you know, around this time every year, I start getting the texts, are we going to be permanent? Are we going to have to let go and uh, come back? So, yeah, I definitely think that's uh, something that I'm hoping uh, when we complete the decommissioning process and we uh, realize uh, what we assess what the savings are going to be, that we can now move uh, some of these savings into areas that are worthy uh, of investment. Well, well I think you're going to be hearing a little bit more from the paraeducator committee uh, in, in the coming months because they're formulating some different ideas and, and different courses of action that I know they're going to present internally and possibly it would require some action from, from the legislature. Okay, thank you. All right. So if no other questions on paraeducators, moving on to the next slide, overdue IEPs and reevaluations. So this is color coded. Uh, you could see here that um, the <clears throat> boxes in blue were, <clears throat> were based on our last oversight hearing. And on the elementary side, we were at 98.4%. As of today, we're at 98.5%. So pretty comparable. On the middle school side, we have 959 and we dropped slightly to 92.9%. And then on the high, it's 896 And now we've actually increased that to 94.5%. So let me explain a little bit about the IEP process. Every year, uh, the educational team comes together. That includes parents um, and anyone else the parent wants to include in that process. We come together and we look at the unique needs. They determine the present level of that student's performance, and they project out goals for the next year. So the reason why it's important and critical that we look at that every year is because we have these benchmarks and we have to determine if there's any progress made, any regression, and how can we address that. So that's why we have that yearly requirement. Um, so if you look at the numbers there, right, even though they're, they're pretty high, what we do, the division is responsible for providing universal technical assistance. So we train everybody. We've had a, a couple of different uh, trainings for teachers this year. We're looking to join with CNI during the summer and provide 
some additional training regarding specifically on special education. And then we had a para I mean, I'm sorry, uh, an administrator academy during um, a few months ago because we wanted to make sure that we got all of the administrators back to the basics and reset. So we're also, when we find that there's an issue, we can also target that TA to particular schools or particular uh, kind of subjects so that we can push out a little more um, guidance. And then for those who are really struggling at, at the school level, what we do is we go in with intensive TA. So as an example of that, we had a few schools this year that had some longstanding non-compliance issues and it really required uh, us to go in and really work hand in hand with the school and we're, we're happy to report that the three schools that had those long-standing non-compliance are at the point now where we've cleared them, okay? So now looking at the, the second uh, set of boxes there, those are triennials, so I, I did need to um, update that. So we are tasked with also every three years doing an assessment to determine continued need for special education services. So we do track um, if those are overdue as well, and those also come with uh, assessments attached to that. So I know in the past you've asked about that, you know, and, and there was some discussion from Mr. Summerfleck because he wanted full testing for all students, you know, full formal testing. And the, the division stance and Department of Education stance is unless there's a big significant change, you know, if you have someone who has autism, for instance, you know, and we're not expected for that disability code to change anytime soon, then we would, we would say we could use existing data and we could use the assessment from the day-to-day -day stuff with the teachers, right? So again, a little bit more um, comprehensive uh, assessment every three years. And if you look at our numbers, we were at 1.6 on the elementary, we're at 1.5% overdue. We're at 4.1 on the middle, 7.1 um, now, and then 10.4 and 5.5. So we've improved on the high school, we've slipped a little bit on the middle school. So what we do on a, on a regular basis every month, we have basically like a report card that goes out to the schools, and then we work with those school administrators that oversee special education. And then we also work with the consulting resource teachers out at the schools. And this is where our central office staff, whether it's the leadership or our coaches, go out and provide that um, close uh, supervision and guidance. So any questions about this uh, slide here? Senator Tidegui. Uh, um, again, can you explain why those numbers have failed in the middle school on the IEPs? Well, what happened there? Um, so, so this is, <clears throat> I can't speak specifically. What, what we do is when we pull these numbers like this, then we have a committee that is a data committee that will go in and scrub the data there. So this is just the, the most recent number for the month and then they pull together. So what we do is um, there's an individual that is tasked with providing the, like putting together the, the meeting, writing up the meeting, submitting all of the documentation. What we're finding lately is either somebody who did the testing did not turn it into our data office, but it was already complete, or uh, a meeting was done, but it wasn't submitted timely before the next time that the, the cycle, so the numbers kind of fluctuate. So what we do is we do the, the data-driven decision-making, and that's where we go in with the universal targeted or intensive TA, depending on um, where we're going. So that, that little bit of slippage there, we're, we're monitoring closely, and we do, a um, couple things that we do differently, we have office hours so that we provide some uh, technical assistance also uh, on a regular basis where um, we have it open every other Friday and then we pull all the case managers in on those uh, other Fridays that we don't have the office hours and then we pull them in so that we can focus specifically on increasing these numbers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Uh, Senator Brown, did you have any questions? No, Senator. Senator Lewan, go ahead, Mr. Tom. <clears throat> okay, so next slide, we have the assistive technology needs, and I know that this has come up the last couple times that we've been here. 
So if you can see here, the number of students whose IEPs stipulate this service are 345. Right now we have 20 pending, not laptops, tablets. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. And Thank these you. are. Thank you. And the last time we had the oversight on uh, November 23rd, we had 18 pending. The 20 pending now are not the same 18. So we were able to. So what happens is on a, on a you know, as a, a meeting happens and they ter determine the need for assistive technology devices, then they'll put in a request. We go through the process and then either we have it on stock or we'll procure it and then we get it out. So these 20 new, these 20 pending are new. Um, same thing with the gross motor wheelchairs, gate trainers, standers. Uh, last time we were here, there were 12 pending. We were able to clear all of those 12 and we have two pending right now, but those are new requests. So we were able to clear out all of the other issues. Right now we have 25 students requiring uh, hearing aids or FM units, there's zero pending. And we also uh, have a cycle where we're going to be replacing all of the hearing aids so that we can update them because, you know, things change, technology changes every couple of years. Any questions uh, about this here? Uh, I, I'm just, uh, when I see the pending, um, just, you know, based on some of the things that were being taken to court for, I'm wondering on the timeline on on some of these uh, pending items, are we being able to meet uh, these needs uh, expeditiously as, as we can? We have an internal SOP policy on, on number of days that things can sit when it comes to our AT. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and have uh, our staff share that with your office. Uh, it doesn't always happen as smoothly, but one thing that we've done is uh, we have put Special education is funding one person in the procurement department to, to just focus on special education um, items. Great. So mm -hmm. that way we don't have to compete with the rest of the department. And that's mainly because of the, the critical need when it is part of an IEP. Thank you, and I know that that's something that uh, came about as a result of the discussions that we've had here, so I really ap appreciate that, uh, Mr. Yes. Uh You guys have any questions on this portion, Senator Tidegui? Senator Brown? Okay. Senator Luan. Okay. Okay, and then I believe the next one is on the busing update. As you know, um, we provide busing door-to-door uh, -door for students who, uh, you know, can access that service. So it's not for every student. It really, we have a checklist on, on students that require that service, and whether it's for mobility issues or because of behavior. Um, and then we also have some regional programs. So when we have a student in the regional program, we take it upon ourselves to provide that transportation. We don't put that, you know, onus on the family. So right now we have a total of 24 buses. 15 are operational. We're at the point, though, where it's kind of at critical mode. Any less than 15 and we start to struggle and we start to have those late arrivals, late buses, and, you know, there's always things that happen, right? There's going to be a flat tire. There's going to be um, a battery that's out. So we do have backup plans for, for those things. And, and so sometimes what happens is uh, a bus will go down. We're in communication with the principals. We let them know. And then we also contact the families, our dispatch contacts family, to let them know. Because we know it's critical for kids, especially kids with autism, that if the bus is supposed to be there at 6.45 and it's not there at 6.45, you could have a meltdown and it could ruin the whole day. So we really are uh, trying hard to make sure that we, we meet those time hacks. That's why, you know, we've had some families that are critical because they said, well, you only waited five minutes, you know, uh, Johnny just got up. And we said, well, if we wait five minutes and, you know, if we did that at every stop, it's going to cause some issues. So we work with those families and we let them know, please have Johnny ready at 6.40, you know, and, and we'll be there. Um, right now we have a total of 15 drivers. We did have a couple folks that had uh, taken positions at other um, places. So we do have a vacancy of three. And we have nine inoperable buses. We're working on a maintenance contract. But five of those nine inoperable are in the process of a survey. So we're trying to determine if uh, we're able to, if the cost of keeping them running is going to make more sense than, you know, scrapping them because we do have a replacement plan. We replace about two every year. 
Okay. Any questions on this? I, I did. Uh, there was a. I don't know if you saw that video that was going around. Uh, there was an issue with the uh, sped bus uh, door. So sometimes things happen, right? And and what we do is we have a backup plan. So if something happens with either the sped, you know, a door or a lift, you know, we we kind of have a just like if if you're going to take your kids in a van and, and you know something happens, right? We have a backup plan. What what we're going to do? So sometimes it might take a little bit a time because not every bus has a lift. So if it requires a lift, we might have to pull in a bus from somewhere else or it, you know, it, it's not always that we only have 15, you know, we, sometimes we have 20, 21 buses operational. We might have to activate the other bus and bring it over. So, you know, it, it's just a part of running a fleet, you know, and having maintenance issues. Yeah, I, I, I mean, honestly, I didn't um, fully understand who the sped fleet was under until uh, some of the bus drivers had uh, reached out to me, which leads to my next question. Is there an issue with the uh, overtime for uh, special education bus drivers or? Should not be. I mean, we do authorize overtime, uh, but we also have a unique schedule because it's a split schedule. Right. They come in, you know, they usually start work uh, before five, sometimes at five, and sometimes because of our situation now with uh, some schools ending, you know, close to five or six in the evening. So some of these folks have a, a split schedule. We either pay them uh, overtime or they're authorized, you know, uh, flex time, which we, we work out internally. So if, if you do hear of anything like that, please bring push it back to us. And, okay, and yeah, that, I think issue. that's what the confusion might have been was uh, I wasn't sure if flex time was uh, uh, something that was offered versus straight uh, overtime. But yeah, if you could just crunch the numbers and if there's anything outstanding, uh, let me know because I did have uh, uh, at least one bus driver uh, reach out. Okay. Okay, okay. thanks. And vacancy, rec oh, Senator Tidegui, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been waiting for this section of the presentation because the bus, I've received, the yeah, okay. the buses. I received an email from a constituent, very concerned. Um, I, I too received uh, the videos that I would like to share with you after this public hearing and forward it to you. Okay. But one of them was actually an expired license plate. Uh, the picture was taken, and it expired in January of 2023, and it's still on there. So we have an expired license plate. That's an issue. Of course, using rope to close the doors, you know, the, the video that uh, Senator um, Barnett was talking about, that was very disturbing, um, which I will share with you if you haven't seen these videos. And the other one was comp time. These bus, bus drivers um, who had to work overtime, sometimes they're, they're offered comp time. But when they want to use it, like during spring break, wanted to use it, they were denied being able to use it. So this is some of the concerns that, that were brought up. And this is all under special ed. You know, the, the bus drivers there, this is not your regular bus. So, um, It says here, um, they only complain is to keep their bus up to standard, to keeping operations going. Okay. So this, this is a huge concern, you know? I mean, whenever there's bus issues that are happening for the, you know, the regular buses, you know, they're addressed right away, but this is sped, you know? This, this is something that we cannot, you know, wait on. Right. Well, first off, I, I'd like to, to get the information from you. Yeah, so that I got the license validate. plate too. Yeah, well, know. the license yeah. plate issue that we're, we are aware of and we're working on, you know, because we know that every year uh, buses need to be um, renewed, get the safety inspection and, and be updated. So we've been pretty good about it. We did struggle a little bit with our maintenance uh, contract. And in order for us to get the safety inspection, we have to have all of that updated. That's not more of my concern because that one we're working on. But the concern is that, you know, our staff feel like they need to go outside to bring this up because this is not something that I'm aware of. If, if people earn, you know, uh, of course we encourage during the breaks to utilize, you know, comp time or overtime. So I'm not really uh, sure. So if, if you could share that information with me, I'd, I'd love to hear it because well, that's news to me. You know, I know these constituents, sometimes they just don't want to, you know, their name put out there. And, and I, I respect that. Um, they sent it to us to, to bring it up. So, But, but um, how would we validate it? I will it, tell though? you that, you know, it, yeah. And, you know, t 
there's always three sides to a story, you know, his, hers, and the truth. Sure. So you don't come blasting out at anybody unless you, you know, completely find out their side of the story before you say anything. So I ask if you could please look into this for the bus issue. I want to report on it. I don't want it something like you tell me, okay, we'll get back to you, and I, I never hear from you. Because sure. I'm a person that follows through, follows through all the time. I mean, I, I know I irritate people that way. <laughs> but, you know, the, it's important to get this information. And I will tell you now that the license plate is 6601. And this expired in January of 2023. Now, if not getting these inspected, I mean, it, it is a big deal. It, it's a huge deal because they probably wouldn't have never passed inspection, you know, if you didn't stay on top of their renewal of, in, you know, of these um, registrations. So I appreciate you looking into that. Look into the comp time that they were denied using their comp time. And they call it comp time. Well, this individual is calling it comp time. I think you call it flexible hours or something sure. that you mentioned earlier, uh, whether it goes there. And I, I have no problem sending you the videos, you know, sure. in case you haven't seen them. I'm, I'm sure you have seen some of them. But I really would like a, um, a report on these buses uh, up to date. How many total do you have? Uh, we have 24. 24 buses. And how many are down? We have nine down. That's quite a bit. But as I mentioned earlier, five are, are up for survey. We, we actually had more. Um, so as we replace the fleet, most of our buses that are operational are within the last four years. So they're... they're all the fairly newer ones. But again, they're on the road. Okay. Yeah, can very, you tell me how many much. are new? Of the I would 24? Have, I would, I would have to get you because we, we replaced, we get, last year we got seven. Um, brand new? Brand new. Okay. So some of that was local funding and, and some of that was federal funding. So, okay. Um, but, uh, but I can get the list for you as, you know, we can, we can break it down for you um, for all of our buses and what year they are and yeah, the, when we anticipate. It's so important to find out the, the age of these buses so that you, and we know procurement, the issues on procurement and trying to get new buses in to replace them. You don't start replacing a bus when it's broken right then and there. You look at the longevity of a bus and realize that its, its age is coming up, you know, for retirement and, and you need to prepare to bring a new bus to come in. You know, so... Planning ahead on these buses is something that many of the agencies lack. Just thinking way ahead. And that's what we need to do. I mean, I know, it, you know the problems are now, today, issues. But at the same time, we have to think ahead you know, uh, to avoid any further problems. With seven brand new buses, how many buses total that you really need to, to provide the services that are required? So like I said, 15 is bare minimum. Bare so minimum. We, like to, okay. we like to have uh, five or six on reserve so that, you know, as things come up and then we also alternate. So um, that's kind of where we're at. So right now we only have 15 drivers because we lost three. And then we also have a dispatcher who is a driver. And then we had lost a, a supervisor about two years ago. So... That, that's why we sometimes have a little more. And then sometimes we have them, you, you know, um, acting as riders when we have some kids who um, act up on the bus and they require an yeah, additional help. intervention. Yeah. So we're, we're having problems with the finding bus drivers then. Is that going to be an issue? Uh, well, an we issue? just opened the position, so um, we should be... You just opened that position? We, we opened the... We, how, how long do you think you can get to fill that position? We have not had issues filling the driver positions. Okay. Yeah. Well, make sure they get tested, you know, big time. Yes, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> in every aspect, and not just, you know, one time when they come in, but, you know, throughout the year. I'd like to see bus drivers tested more often. Senator Brown had brought that up. You know, that's, I think it's very important that we do that. Right. Um, other than that, um, I'll get your email address and send you those videos. Okay. And please. Okay. Thank you. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on the questions and comments by Senator Tello. Um, 
You, you don't have a large number of bus drivers, but um, have you been doing annual testing or regular testing on your bus drivers? Because they are designated positions. Right, so anytime there is like a fender bender, an accident, I know that we do mandatory testing. Uh, we, we've tried to be, work with our EMRO um, and we're trying to come up with a, a plan. We have had testing a few years ago, but um, we're trying to work into the a regular cycle for, for testing. So no, we have not. You know, it's not that complicated to do it for 15 bus drivers, and it should be something that should be done on an annual basis, I mean, unannounced. Uh, most of Guam simply does it at the beginning of the hiring, but we have a major drug problem on Guam. Oh my gosh, that's flash news. Um, and so I would like to, certainly, I'm sure we all do, that, that these individuals that are in these positions, that are transporting our children, um, are drug-free, especially now that we have such a free culture of, you know, even wanting to authorize cannabis and even making it an issue that you can't even ask those questions of people being employed in the government of Guam. Even though they say, oh, well, you know, transportation-related positions, uh, you know, they, they can't partake of this, but, you know. Unfortunately, some people don't have personal sense of boundaries and anything and everything goes. We saw that recently with Department of Public Works with a bus driver that, and it concerns me you say you don't have a supervisor. Uh, because the supervisors, particularly in DPW, are supposed to be at these bus stations or bus substations like four or five o'clock in the morning and meeting with their bus drivers to ensure that their bus drivers are capable and ready to drive and that they're not drunk and that they're not high on meth. Right. And so, so, when we get so when we get reports from the Guam police that these individuals are being arrested because they're on meth or in one case I drove by a bus driver on Cross Island Road that was stopped by the Guam police only to find out that police, that particular bus driver was exceeding the level of alcohol in their system and were pulled over by the Guam Police Department. So even though, you know, of course, DPW's numbers are like 100 plus more than you, what you have, 150 and up, um, it's an issue and it has been an issue. So if you're not doing regular testing, I'd recommend you facilitate that because it's not that complicated to do uh, and it should be done. Um, and then who is checking these bus drivers to make sure so that they So they report to a program coordinator for. So it, it's not that they don't have, they, the title bus driver supervisor is a title that we, we've had before, but that, that position we had trouble recruiting for. Um, it does require a lot of, you know, uh, oversight of the drivers and, and we have had trouble recruiting for that actual position, but we, we have somebody that oversees the drivers and then we have a driver that is seasoned that he operates our uh, command central, you know, he's the dispatch. So we, unfortunately, because of the routing, we have students all over the entire island and we have the 15 buses. So we, we don't have a central hub for, for each one of them. So we have them spread out through the island and so, so where are go. these buses, where are they parked when they're not so operable? They're parked either at a school or at uh, like the busing uh, depot, for instance, in, in Dededo. They, they could have a couple at one school and then we have a couple at uh, the busing depot. So they're in a secure area that's monitored and a uh, locked area. And then our folks access it because it's pretty early. I know we have some at Tizen. So it's just spread out through, through the island. They don't take their buses home. Um, they, they're at a government facility. And then we, we come in in the morning, get them, and then they secure them in the afternoon. But what you're telling me is there's nobody, is there anybody out there that's actually checking these bus drivers before they get on their routes? Uh, they call in, but no, there's not an actual individual to, to do like a look-see on them, you know, like where they're gonna do an assessment. So, and I'm not even sure how, how we would be able to do that around the island. I mean, maybe a check-in via the call, but I don't know how we would be able to, to have somebody physically at 15 locations. Is there any reason you can't coordinate with DPW to do that and have these buses located at these substations? You know, we, we've tried and we, we've had a, a strong working relationship with DPW. In, in the past, we've also uh, attempted to, because because we don't have uh, mechanics, we don't have, uh, you know, a service station. And, and, you know, so we've tried to, I used to oversee the busing a few years ago directly. 
and we've tried to see what we could do to have a, a closer working relationship with them. Maybe even having, giving them, you know, oversight of the, the programming, but that's a lot of liability for them and they, they didn't feel like they wanted to take that on. Uh, so we've also explored the idea of contracting, but in terms of how much it was going to cost, based on what we were looking at, it was not feasible. So um, we'll continue to look at that, you know, because we do have challenges with, you know, our, our fleet and maintaining buses because that's not something, you know, in our typical scope, right? Sure. Um, but but as, as something comes up, we, we do an after action review and then we try to fix it each time, you know, and, and try to plan ahead. But definitely the yearly testing, um, I'm all for that. Uh, just need to figure out the, the... Actually, there's an executive order that was put in place that exists okay. that actually requires it. Then we will... Um, and the fact that you do not have anyone there as a supervisor regularly checking on these bus drivers before they get on the road. I mean, I wish we didn't have to do that. I wish everyone in their respective positions were responsible, but that's not the reality. And, you know, sometimes the people you least expect um, that are on meth are on meth. Right. Um, and so I don't want to take it for granted. I'm sure these are all good people, but I think we just want some insurance, you know, uh, that that process is in place and that you put something in place because it's, I'm, I, you know, don't worry, DPW is in my eye too because the fact that these bus drivers were put on the road with children in their buses, that tells me somebody's not doing their job and they do have supervisors that are supposed to be at the bus stations in the morning at four o'clock inspecting these bus drivers to make sure that they're fit to drive buses. Uh, and when those things slip through the cracks, it tells me someone's not doing their job. So I think you need to come up with something a little better to verify and have some comfort level to the public that these children um, are being safely transported. Because to me, that's the priority. We lose sight of the mission. We're too into our individual needs of individual employees, and we're not looking at what the outcome is. And for those of you that are in charge, um, you know, that's your job to make sure that they, they're doing their job and they're doing it safely. So. You, I, and then I just want to wrap up, Mr. Chairman, on the maintenance contract. Do you currently have maintenance contracts in place for the maintenance of your buses? Do you have uh, a company you take them to? If it breaks down, the door isn't working, we take it to X Auto or whatever the case is? Right. So it, it's in the final stages of the procurement process right now. So we, we did. It's just it, there was a lapse. So no, we don't have a contract right Half now. Half a day. Why not? You guys have your own procurement division that continues to come up time and time again. Why do you not have a contract for the maintenance of, you know, we're not dealing with a fleet of 150 buses. Why not? I'm going to have to get back to you on, on exactly the specifics as we, we and, trace. And you, and you would agree that the operability of these buses are critical to your mission, right? Definitely. You can't get these children safely to and from school. They can't, you know, get the education that they need. So, Definitely. You know, we're not in a learning process. We're not going through intro 101, and these are basic, and I, I am critical, yes I am, because I've had to deal my share. I've carried my own heavy load. Uh, these are basic critical needs to your operation, the fact that they're not in place, especially when you have the ability to, to do your own procurement, is bothersome. I and then agree. you wonder why we're upset because we're sitting here going, hey, folks, this is your everyday job for some of you. I wish I had a single assignment every day, and that's all I got to do every day, make sure I got it down. Uh, but the fact is, I mean, be at the broken door, and I've not seen the video. <laughs> don't, maybe I don't want to. I'll be more irritated, you know. Um, come on, guys. If that is your oversight and that, you know, we're in the process, we're working on this, we're working on this, we're working on this. Well, at some point, there's an expectation of deliverables. I think the public has the expectation. We don't get to walk and cruise. I mean, if we're running for re-election this year, as we are every other year if we're here, uh, the public gets to decide on our performance and whether we're performing or not, whether they like what we're doing or not. So if we feel we're, we're here being critical, because we're hearing, we, we, we're sitting through session, we get, nowadays people can very directly access us, relaying their concerns and their complaints, and if they're reasonable, if they're within the scope of our responsibilities, then by all means we need to be held accountable for it. So when you get that, and we get that regularly, these type of responses, you know, it just doesn't set well, because it's like, why are we just working on it? Why don't you have regular maintenance and contracts all year round? It should be a standard expectation that maintenance contracts are in place. So 
when there's a need for repair, something's down, you know, especially because you do have a private contract who can do the work for you. Right? Right. Okay, Mr. Chair, thank you. Sujo Swasi, Senator Brown. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Babalta. Uh, you're uh, spent, uh, bus drivers, they're specialty drivers, are they not? Do they have to get certification for the special population that they transport? We, we provide in-house training for okay. them. So they just require the, the same licenses, okay. um, chauffeur's license. And, okay. and then we, when, when they are hired upon hiring, part of the onboarding is we provide all of the additional sure. training. The reason why I was asking is just, um, you know, when your buses go down, I'm just wondering if, um, because they, GRTA, they do have buses that have lifts as well. I'm just wondering if their buses or their drivers as well are specialty drivers and whether or not you can get into an MOU with GRTA, um, you know, in the event that you may need the augmentation of, of, uh, of a bus or two or even a driver or two for that specific time. So I'm just wondering if uh, you'd be able to do something like that. Their fleet is pretty limited. I mean, it's something we could look into. I know that during the um, recent crisis when we had the, the typhoon, they were actually utilizing our oh. buses because they didn't have enough okay. uh, to transport. So we, we were allowing them to utilize our buses with our drivers and sometimes without our drivers. So, um, you know, that, but that's something, you know, we, we can look at. We, we would probably prefer to have command and control over sure, ours, so, sure. you know, having more of our buses operational. No, I'm just wondering, because I, I mean, um, I heard this uh, a while back that they, uh, they had monies available uh, through the Biden administration. Um, they're going, I think they're going through electric buses, I think that what it is. And I'm just wondering if, uh, again, because they have the funding or supposedly that, uh, you know, should you guys get into a bind that you can get into some right. kind of uh, MOU or, you know, a temporary right. period of time? Well, well we, we also were given those uh, opportunities. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, we weren't qualified because they needed to be uh, diesel engines and we have all regular gasoline engines. So for some reason, we, we didn't qualify for, for, that, uh, for that program when they were electrifying. Um, the fleet. So we, we got word from uh, the vendors and we were working with them, but we weren't able to, to avail of that program. Really? I mean, really? Be because you're diesel and you had to have gas? No, we're gas and, gas. and it and had, to, had be to be a diesel? diesel engine. Yeah, it was a requirement wow. for, for that particular that, That's kind of weird case. because they're transitioning out from gas to, <laughs> to electric and, right. and Right. It's still fossil fuel. Both of our, right. our fossil fuels. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not the <laughs> funding agency, right? So no, no, I, no, I know I, that the superintendent asked me I, to, yeah. to really work on that, but we weren't able to. Yeah, no, that. I just I just don't understand the the, the reasoning, yeah. and uh, I mean they're both. Anyway, yeah. maybe we'll try to find out. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Luhan. Uh, Ms. Ravata, is that it? I know there is the vacancy recruitment. Right. I, I think okay. there's just one one or two additional okay. slides here. So. Um, we have the vacancy recruitment, uh, vacancy and recruitment slide here. So um, we have case managers that run those meetings. We have a vacancy of three. We have a need for one physical therapist. We have a need for two occupational therapists. Right now, we only have a contract with a virtual occupational therapist. So that one's a little bit tricky. We have a need for five speech therapists. We do have a four that we're picking up. Uh, this coming year that we're part of a cohort recently and they're going to go ahead and do their um, yearly clinical, what is it called? Year, what is it? Their fellowship and then once they're done with that they can be full-fledged uh, speech and language uh, pathologists. We're needing three behavior specialists. We mentioned about the three bus drivers. We need two school psychologists, um, one psychoacademic evaluator, and our regional emotional disability classroom, uh, we, we need four. Um, right now, we have some difficulty recruiting for that because those kids tend to be very um, aggressive and require a lot of energy in working with, with that population. So if you go to the next slide, <laughs> Oh, well, 
Sorry, we took that slide out. So uh, as you know, our SPED dashboard has all of these updates. Uh, what we try to do is we try to update it on a monthly basis. So if you want to see our budget, local, federal, if you want to see what our um, vacancies are, you want to see our IEP completion rate, um, you know, so it, it's all on our SPED dashboard. Um, and I think you can access it through this QR code. Um, also, you can access it through our Department of Education website. So, you know, I know we get calls often about how many students uh, are, have autism, for instance. You could just get on and, and find out, you know, real time. Okay. But uh, any other questions? Senator Tidegui. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, want to know if you've included this into the DOE budget, these positions. Um, so these positions here are, are the positions that are on our federal side. Okay. So the ones that are on the... I general don't, fund? I don't believe we, we... I don't believe we put any of these on the... On the general... So that those positions general. that you just mentioned? These are from, from the federal, federal side. funding? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Senator Brown, did you have any... Senator Luan? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Valta. I, yeah. I just want to uh, point out, though, that I, I will take, uh, you know, your suggestions, you know, into account. Uh, I agree we need that, well, we're mandated to do the yearly testing, so we'll go ahead and do the, we'll, we'll activate that as soon as possible. Hopefully they're not watching because we're not supposed to let them know ahead of time, right? So, but if they are watching, you know, it's coming. And uh, we, we will look at, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out ways to, to get in front of things. So I, I know that, you know, we do come here and we have the same challenges each time, and I agree with you that it is very frustrating. So we are, we are working on it. Sijos Masi, uh, Mr. Babata. Superintendent, anything further? The, la the last slide, please. <clears throat> That's it. Okay, right, right on. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, and we'll see you in uh, 30 days. I'll, I'll be in touch. There's some, some other, or not you, Mr. Rabata, but uh, <laughs> Superintendent Swanson. Uh, actually, before you go, is there an issue? I know we're, uh, we're entertaining a bill that's going through the process, Bill 10937, and it's relative to service learning hours. So I just need to hear from uh, you or anybody on your leadership team, is there an issue with service learning hours that's going to impact the graduating class of, of 2024? The only the only thing I've I've seen is their request that they've done through the, the the student legislative group to prorate the number of service learning hours, and I support that. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Uh, we're now going to open it up for public comment. I believe we have one person, Mr. Santos. Anybody who wants to provide public uh, comment, feel free to come up and uh, provide it at this time. Good afternoon. My name is Derek Santos. I am the principal at Enron Middle School. I'm also part of a committee that was uh, created to try and address the situation with uh, paraeducators, 128s. And so I'll speak on my behalf and also with the committee members with regards to the situation that we are currently facing in our department. And uh, they shared some information up there with regards to how many 128s we currently have versus how many we need. And so we are short, uh, tremendously short. And in the whole, I think, God, I don't know, about maybe six, seven months, we've been operating at a very low capacity of one-to-one -one aids. And the concern that we have right now is um, very serious for us because on May 24, our one-to-one -one aids will be, I don't know what's the word, if it's put on hold because they're part-time. So they initially will not be getting any benefits, pay, after the 24th, and many of my aides, I can speak for my, the people that I've uh, worked with, and they've already shared that coming back to the department will be very 
challenging because for two months they won't have a paycheck. And they, again, because they're part-time, they won't, we have funds for them come August, but we don't have any funds to sustain 190 of them roughly from May 24 to August. So many of them are gonna have to seek other jobs. They need benefits, they need to be able to take care of their family, put food on the table. And so we, again, are, well, again, I'll speak on my behalf of my uh, colleagues and all that, that we are struggling trying to uh, keep, sustain the age that we currently have, but we're also struggling to prepare for next school year because then we are already short about 100, about 100 aides currently short. And next year we are anticipating about 400 aides that will be needed, 120 aides that will be needed to work with the number of students that have been identified with their IEPs. And we are extremely short. So if we lose any of the, it's gonna to be tough, tougher for us to try and, and, and you know, address all the, the needs of our special needs kids. And so we are here to advocate to the legislature and let them know that come May 24, I mean, yeah, May 24, they will no longer have any uh, hours to collect until August because they are limited term part-time. And we need, we still have a lot of things that we need to address for summer school training and all those things that they need so that we can build on that uh, capacity for them to service our kids. And in one of our meetings, we talked about how ironic it is for the students with the most amount of needs to be serviced by the least amount of pay. You know, the staff, it, it, it's, they're the ones who need the most help, the kids, yet we have the staff members who make the least amount of pay servicing them, helping them get through the days, and it's tough. And I shared again with my colleagues that, you know, being a 128, I've been a 128, it's not a dream job. It's not something that we wake up and say, you know what, I wanna be an aide. It's a tough job. It requires a lot of compassion, understanding, support, uh, commitment. And so when we lose good people, now I, I've, I've seen some of you guys up there at the Special Olympics, I don't know if you know that many of the people that are up there supporting our kids were, are the 128s. And to know that they're there on a Saturday, not getting compensated, there's no overtime, there's no extra pay. They do it because they love the kids and they wanna help. But to let them know that come May 24, there is no paycheck after that. That's it, until August when they come back, if they come back. And so we have a breakdown, it's on the slides that were shared earlier about what is gonna be needed to sustain them until that. And even having a discussion about um, why, you're, you mentioned earlier about what is it gonna take for them to stay. There is no incentive, none. They need to pay the bills, so they have to come in. And I know, again, this is a systemic issue. This is not the first time that we've gone through this, but we need a better system, a better process on how to work with it. In the meantime, we are gonna be working with administrators and IEP teams on how to address the growing number of paraeducators one-to-one aids because it is growing. We now are having to service almost 400 students and the number of special needs students has actually dropped, but the number of students with special needs that need paraeducators and one-to-one aids has gone up. And we have data again that will support that, so you can look at that. But right now, I, the biggest concern is that they will lose their, they pretty much will have to find other work opportunities come May 24. Okay, so again, uh, on behalf of the committee and you know our administrators, uh, we are looking for some financial support because the federal dollars already have been maxed out. They already pay for 200, about 200 some uh, aids, but only 105 of them are full time. So basically we have to, you know, try and figure out how to help them get through the months because it's tough. We can't even train them right now because their minds are all about, well, what, what's gonna happen after May? They don't have a job until August. So that's, that's my testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Santos, yeah, and I mean, this is a conversation that we had with Mr. Rabauta in the beginning of the year. I know that things are in uh, play. I was just texting uh, Mario Cotta GCC and they're working on the paraeducator uh, boot camp, but you know, I agree, uh, and we need to see the numbers from the superintendent. You know, this is something that if we're going to do this, I think we just got to do it. And you got to tell us how much is it going to cost, how many employees are we talking about, 
if there's a level up uh, nice. necessity for their for their skill set. Yeah, because it's something. It, it's just like the conditions in the schools. We talk about it, talk about it. We just got to do it. So, yeah, I'll, I'll get with the superintendent, and if we could see those uh, numbers, and you know, find out uh, more about how we can yes, sustain sir. these employees. Because you're right. It's I was getting the text last year around this time. I'm getting them now, and like I said earlier, um, people. They're not doing it for the pay. They're doing it because they love the kids. But Absolutely. you're right. I mean, this population that we're serving, I think uh, that, you know, it requires a lot of uh, hard work and they have to be compensated uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Senator Brown? I just want to ask, do you have these, these school aides for, the, for these, the children with special needs? I mean, are all of them part-time or are they? Most of them. We, we only have 105 right now that are federally funded. And then I believe 19 are locally funded so, that are full-time. So, so Okay, so you only have 19 that are full-time? Under the local, the local side of the okay. funds. Everything else is all federal. And, and so and is the federal requirement that they only be part-time employees? No, they, it's, just, fund it's just how far our funds can be stretched, especially, uh, again, with the rise in number of uh, students who are in need of one to one aids, it's, it's going up. And our data, we can share the data, they have it. So you already have the positions in place that could be applied for if they were put in place and made full-time? Uh, we don't have the funding, enough funding for that it, to be full-time uh, th through the, maybe I don't understand the question, so. My, my question is the positions already exist. A position exists. Correct. There's a position title that is full-time that exists in DOE for these, these full -time? aids? Full-time? I'm not sure. There is? Okay, so there is full-time, but is there funding to support that? If we were to permanize all of the, the employees that we have, every year when they get their increments, that would you know, be uh, an additional um, cost. And when we're talking upwards of 400 employees with the additional, you know, that, that's kind of where, I understand. where we're struggling. I understand that process. Yeah. So it's just a question of priorities and what does Department of Education determine their priorities to be? Because it does seem strange that you know, these children that have special needs that are again, our mission, right, as the children, um, are not being funded. And I understand if anyone's in that position that they don't have any, any stability of employment, and especially it is a challenging position. I, I can understand the dynamics that's being created here, but it, it's a question of priority for DOE. Because when I have administrators or others that are looking at more pay raises and not, you know, where's the priority? Guys, a lot of these things you're bringing to us are internal management issues that can be prioritized within the Department of Education. I'm sure there are other areas that could be cut. There's probably a few administrators we could sacrifice even. If the need is there to do it, then so be it. I really, these, a lot of these are management tools that are available to your leadership to address. And I only say that because I've run major operations in this government and these things are not, we're not running down to the legislature saying, can you do this for us? Put the budget together if it can be, but I'll tell you it's a question of priority. And obviously this has not been a priority, otherwise you wouldn't be bringing this to our attention because this is something that should be addressed in-house, in DOE. If I may, Senator, I, I do agree that prioritization is necessary, but with all the changes and challenges that the department is going through, it's not, the funding is just not gonna be there. It's not enough to address, if it's not one thing, it's another. And, I, and when I, you don't have enough, and there will never be enough. Correct. There will never be enough money in the government of Guam to fund every operation. There never will be. And that's where you start prioritizing. And you work from the children backwards. And everything else that's unnecessary or not as critical after that, then you don't fund. I agree. And I don't see that. I agree. I don't see that. I see everything being put on the table and saying we need to fund all this. And yet where we're supposed to be directly servicing our children, it's not being addressed. Okay, I agree That's that... That's what there, I see from this side of the aisle. Understood. I'm just trying to tell you, uh, Senator, that yes, there is a priority that needs to be addressed in our department, in every department. But with regards to the amount of money that is being funded to the Department of Education, it is not enough to address all the concerns. I mean, you know, not I, only the one to one aids, but also and I, and the school here, facilities. I am not here at a public hearing to debate. I, I'll leave that for my role on the floor. But I will have to tell you, when I see other operations in this community that do what they do for so far less than what it's costing individually per child in the Department of Education, I got a big question mark in my mind. And I'll tell you, since I was a kid in Department of Education, when I was one of your children, 
Um, I got a lot more overhead than I used to have in the administrative side of the house. So, you know, this argument that I hear it, I've been around here, I've been here longer than anyone else here aside from Senator Tina. Um, this whole issue about the money, the money, the money. Well, you got money to figure out and maybe you don't have everything you want and that's not you in particular. I'm talking to your administration here. Then you prioritize and everything away from the children to me is a minus. Every other critical, every other position that defines this and that at the admin and the big central office, if I were in charge, that's where I'd be looking at. If I, because there's not going to be, and please don't expect that there's an endless stream of money because we know there's not. And that day of reckoning is coming. And I didn't vote for the 22% pay raise because it means positions are not going to be able to be sustained because of it. Wonderful when you get it. I'm not complaining. But I'll tell you when, you, when you can't address the most critical needs in your operation, something's wrong. When you're paying for everything else and you can't take care of this, then something's wrong. So as a policymaker, I'm bringing that up, especially when I hear these issues being brought to us that could be addressed in-house. That's where you, Mr. Superintendent, tell me what you're gonna cut if you have to, to fund to ensure that these aides are here for these special needs children, because that to me is a priority. Everything else to me is not a priority. So I, I'm going to ask you to bring that to the House. If you're not getting much more this upcoming budget year, because I, unlike some of my colleagues here that want to be Santa Claus, and hey, no problem, I got the money, I'll give it to you. The day of reckoning is coming. We're starting to see those numbers go down. The 10 million they were spending every month is now what, down to 2 million? Was it 2 million? Oh my goodness, really? It's not falling from the sky? That reality is coming. And when it does, Real leadership is able to figure out how do they manage the most critical priorities. I don't want to preach, but you know what? When I see and hear this, and I don't blame you for bringing up, you bring up a very legitimate need, but it's also bringing to the attention that something as critical as servicing the most needed children in our educational system is not being met. That tells me leadership is not prioritizing this area. And the tough decisions got to be made. You prioritize what's most critical and what is not as critical Maybe you gotta let it go and you don't fund it. Anyway, that's all I have to say, but I do appreciate you, because this is bringing to light um, something's backwards here. We definitely need uh, some uh, brainstorming to tackle all the situations that uh, DOE is. Because I, I, I don't blame those employees that are aides of, of mm -hmm. being in the position. That's, that's a tough job to have, and then to have no sense of security and to live a couple months out of the year and no, no income. Yes, it is. It, it's a tough make thing. Doesn't any sense, right? And, uh, that to me should be prioritized. Yes, I agree. And exactly uh, like we said earlier, the number of aides have risen in the last four years. It's gone up tremendously. And so uh, we have the data, that, again, that you guys are free to look at so that you can see the number of the trends of how many uh, students with one-to-one -one needs have grown, uh, especially in the autism community. Uh, it's, it's really uh, grown substantially. I appreciate so. you coming, providing your testimony. Thank you. Thank you thank very much, you. Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Brown. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to agree with Senator Brown. It's frustrating when we hear how we're trying to cut corners to make ends meet for our students with special needs, but then I hear other things like we're creating a new deputy superintendent position, right? The, the benefit has to go to the students in the classroom, and, and I think this uh, decommissioning, it's really highlighting for me how student enrollment has declined, but GDOE has continued to ask for more money. So there, there is a great reckoning coming, and I, I, you know, I pray that it doesn't hit uh, GDOE as hard as it's going to hit the rest of the government. Um, Senator Tidewe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I'd like to thank the superintendent for allowing uh, individuals to come forward from the agency, department agency, to testify. You know, usually they don't. Usually they, they put a muzzle on every employee at DOE. You know, the superintendent says, no, you can't get in front. So first, thank you for allowing your, your employees to come forward and uh, bringing this issue. I mean, it's, it's been a while. Um, I remember parapros, you know, hanging out and, you know, taking care of us during school. And, um, and the aides have always been left behind you know, when it comes to, you know, providing them an adequate, you know, pay and, and keeping them coming back. So we hear you and I thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. I mean, I will ask the superintendent to provide more information on, on what he plans to do, how he addresses it, because it is, it's true. Senator Brown, it is an internal situation. You know, at, at this point, we don't want to be micromanaging Department of Education. 
at all. We, we do oversee it to make sure it's being done right and, and questioning. But um, I would, Mr. Superintendent, like to hear from you and your comments with regards to this. Uh, provide us your input at another time, but um, we'd like it very soon because budget time is coming up and we're going to need to have that information. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Cito Samasi, Senator Tidegui. Senator Lujan? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Santos, for bringing that to our attention. You know, um, you're talking about the AIDS, uh, and you said after the 24th, they would be May 24th, sir. May, wait, yes. May 24th. And that's because the, the end of the school year, right? Correct. And, okay. How many of these uh, special, um, special needs kids go to, uh, to um, summer school? Well, uh, many of them do. Uh, some of them through the ESY, okay. extended school year uh, process. Okay. But uh, many other parents try to go through this process because, again, this is one way for them to help their child sustain the information they've sure. generated. Because sure. in special needs, uh, sure. anytime you have a two and a half month layoff, sure. it, it does affect their you know, ability to retain the information. Sure. So, yes, many will take advantage of it. And... Uh, we try our best to sustain with what the re limited resources we have. So, so that, that being said, uh, the ones that uh, do go to school, um, do you retain their one-on-one -on -one aids then for that or no? Well, no, because they essentially will not have any job, you know, after the 24th until August. Sure. We do try to maximize with the, the full-time sure. aids, uh, sure. try to move them around the, the island to support where there's need. Uh, but definitely uh, we are going to need support. And then we can't do any training until we get them on board. But again, the chances of uh, 190 re being retained come August ain't going to happen. Many of them will quit. And sure. uh, like they were sharing earlier, we only have about 11 that applied for the job. And it's open. <laughs> the job announcement sure. is open and we don't have. So come May 24, sir, if we don't have any solution for them, we will lose substantially a lot of them because there is no reason for them to hang around. They need to sure. pay the bills. Yeah. So it's time sensitive for us, sir. Yeah, sure. You, you know, um, and if, a few months ago, parents uh, came and testified, uh, most especially the parents who had uh, uh, kids with autism. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the transition going into, uh, you know, a lot of the kids, of course, with, uh, with uh, autism are used to, you know, um, structured days. Mm -hmm. And, you Correct. know, when they go into the summer, again, to transition into not going to school, and then, and then when they go back to school again, it, 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 it takes a while. You know, Mr. Summerflick had, a, had um, um, a good idea that we do something with, uh, with the, the teacher corps at the University of Guam as well as GCC, that uh, the kids in the summer <clears throat> attend either university or GCC under the, their, their um, teaching programs. And that way the, the teachers-to-be have a, a, a good feel already of what they're getting into. And they would know the population that they're, that they're dealing with. And this gives them as, as well, um, you know, the, the students with special needs year-round schooling, basically. You know, maybe with a few well, the, 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 and things like that. But I'm just, I'm just wondering. I mean, if, if you know, again, thinking out of the out of the box to be able to do something like that and to be able to sustain again their one-on-one -on -one aids. Not necessary that they they will lose their jobs, but to sustain that because they they will they will need it regardless of where they go. Whether they go to the University of Guam, you know, under the working with the, the the teacher corps there or the or the um, or GCC, they would still need their one-on-one -on -one aids. I'm trying to look at ways to be able to, to, to sustain, again, these employment for, uh, you know, our most vulnerable uh, population. I mean, it's, it's a derelict of our duty <laughs> to not provide them Absolutely. With, with, uh, with, you know, with, with, with their needs. And all of us are going to be special needs at one point or another, and we're going to need assistance. And these, these are our kids that need our assistance now. Yes, so, immediately. Yes. Thank you. So, anyway, I hope that we can uh, continue. I hope so too, Senator. The, the, uh, that's conversation, so we can either transition from from DOE to in the summertime or whatever major breaks that we have that we can deal with with these teacher teacher core um, classes. Well, that's definitely an option, sir. But we are uh, a month away. 
a little over that to determine what what the fate of the power educator is going to be. I, I hope and pray that we would act on that before then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masi. Thank you, Mr. Santos, for your testimony. And that will conclude this uh, oversight hearing conducted by the Committee on Education, Public Safety, and the Arts. I want to thank the superintendent uh, and also uh, Mrs. LePay for her testimony and all of the GDOE uh, management team uh, to include the principals who came to support in the facilities and uh, maintenance. Uh, had. So, Sidos Masi, again, this uh, hearing is concluded at 1.55 tomorrow standard time. Guahusi Senator Chris Malafunction Barnett, Esta, adios.